I was investigating a case of stolen sled dogs at a kennel near Silver Bay, Alaska. The problem started in the early fall before the first snowfall. On multiple occasions, one or two dogs would go missing at a time. If you've never been to a sled dog kennel, the dogs are typically housed outside, tethered to their individual shelters. The mushers run them once or twice a day, except in the summer so they wouldn't overheat. This particular kennel was close to the musher's house. He could see most of the dogs from his front window. If I remember correctly, there were around 65 dogs on the property in total. It was an ongoing case as we could never figure out exactly what was happening. The musher was convinced the dogs were being stolen. Every time, the dogs would disappear at night and he would find their empty collars in the morning. I thought the dogs were just slipping out of their collars and escaping themselves, but the musher wasn't convinced. He said the collars on the dogs were martingale collars and were nearly impossible to escape. Someone had to loosen them to release the dogs. I questioned why they would loosen the collars instead of just unclip the tether. That would make the most sense to me if I was trying to steal a dog. I would keep the collar on the thing so it couldn't get away from me. These dogs were huskies. They weren't exactly known for sticking around when loose. There wasn't much I could do about the situation unless I had legitimate proof of the dogs being stolen. I told the musher to set up some trail cams, which he did. That way, we would have concrete evidence of what was happening to the dogs. Problem was, the dogs were still going missing but nothing on the trail cams. Not a thing. I sent out a notice to all the local veterinarians and animal shelters in the area to be on the lookout for these missing dogs. We put out notices on multiple social media platforms and even offered rewards, but we received no responses. And then winter came. The snowfall would give us the means to find out what exactly was happening to these sled dogs. If they were indeed being stolen, we would have the footprints of the perpetrators as well as vehicle tracks. The musher called me a couple of days after the first big snowfall of the year and said another dog went missing and I had better get out there as soon as possible. I told him not to disturb the scene and that I would be out immediately. I cleared my morning schedule that day and drove out to the kennel. Now, I would consider myself a logical person. I'm not superstitious in any way. I don't believe in monsters. I knew there would be some reasonable explanation for this at the end of the day when I dug down to the truth. But I wasn't ready for what I found out there. It flipped everything I had ever believed to be true, right on its head. The musher showed me to the shelter of the latest missing dog, his footprints were the only human prints there. Obviously, there were dog tracks, but there was something else there, too. They were too large to be wolf tracks, but they were definitely of the canine variety. They were about the size of my own feet, but the problem was, there were only tracks from the rear feet, only one set of tracks. I had done quite a bit of hunting and tracking in my youth. I knew what animal tracks looked like. I knew how they moved. If I didn't know better, I would say this thing walked on two legs. The musher mentioned it too. We both just looked at each other, but neither of us wanted to say what we were thinking because, frankly, it didn't make any sense. I took photos of the tracks and examined the area as thoroughly as I could. I found another strange print on the roof of the missing dog's shelter. It looked like a handprint of some sort. There were only four fingers on the hand and there appeared to be claw marks etched into the snow at the ends of the fingers. I didn't know what to tell the musher. We both knew there was something out of the ordinary going on here, but neither of us wanted to start speculating because our ideas sounded crazy. We ended up following the wolf tracks across the property and through a dense forest until we lost them when they crossed an old logging road the musher used for sledding. I didn't have much advice for the musher, I told him he was well within his rights to defend his dogs with lethal force if he caught whatever was taking them. He went to town later that day and installed a temporary electric fence around the dog yard, hoping to keep whatever the creature was out. I didn't hear from the musher for a few weeks after that and he didn't return my last phone call, so I decided to make the drive up to the kennel. He was in the process of building a barn to house his dogs indoors and there was also an electric fence around the barn. 
He looked rough when I finally saw him, like he hadn't slept in weeks. I asked him if he had any more problems with his dogs going missing, but he was tight-lipped about it. It took a while, but I finally got the story out of him. He didn't want me to think he was crazy, and to be honest, I probably would have if I hadn't seen those strange tracks myself. He said he finally caught the thing at night in the dog yard. He said it looked like a cross between a wolf and a man. It was covered in gray hair and had the head of a wolf, but it could walk upright when it wanted to. He said it walked up to one of his dogs and tried to take its collar off it. He took a shot at it. He couldn't tell if he hit it or not, but the shot sent it running. He watched it head off into the forest. He also felt were some of his dogs in the forest as well. He wondered what the creature wanted with them. And frankly, what exactly was the creature and where did it come from? Had it always lived there in the Northwoods? I didn't have an answer for him. I don't think he expected me to. I do know that he built an extensive indoor kennel for his dogs, and that seemed to keep them safer. He never called again about the wolf creature again, although I'm certain it's still out there somewhere. This is a story about my grandmother and her belief that my youngest cousin, Alex, was once possessed by a demon. Her conviction is so strong to this day that it's hard not to believe her. My aunt and uncle died in a car wreck when Alex was two, so he lived with my grandmother until he went off to college. I always attributed Alex's behavioral problems to him losing his parents at such an early age, but my grandmother swears up and down that he had to be possessed by a powerful demon. Luckily, he has since beaten all the odds and has turned out to be a great young man, but he was quite the handful growing up. My grandmother lives in a small town in the countryside. She's always been a devout Catholic and has always believed in the existence of demons and other supernatural entities. Her belief was strengthened after an incident that occurred with Alex when he was only six years old. My grandmother was the one who noticed that something was wrong with him. He was always a happy and energetic child, but suddenly he became withdrawn and would often talk to himself in a strange voice. My grandmother was convinced that he was possessed by a demon and did everything in her power to help him. It started with Alex having nightmares every night. He would wake up screaming and my grandmother would comfort him. But then things started to get worse. One day, my grandmother found him talking to himself in a strange voice, and he didn't seem to recognize her. She tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't respond. My grandmother took Alex to the priest in their church, hoping that he would be able to perform an exorcism. But the priest was skeptical and told her that there was nothing he could do. My grandmother refused to give up and continued to search for help. One night, my grandmother woke up to the sound of Alex screaming. She rushed to his room and found him writhing in his bed. His eyes were closed, but he was speaking in a language that she couldn't understand. She called for help, and they managed to calm him down. My grandmother sought help from different people, including healers, priests, and even some paranormal investigators. Some of them dismissed her claims while others offered to help, but were unsuccessful in their attempts. As time passed, Alex's behavior became more erratic. He would throw things and speak in tongues, and my grandmother was convinced that he was possessed by a demon. She tried to keep him close and even stopped going to work to take care of him. My grandmother was terrified that Alex would hurt himself or someone else. She was also worried that the demon would never leave him and that he would be lost forever. One day, while my grandmother was out buying groceries, Alex started to scream again. This time, he began to throw things around the room, including his own body. My grandmother came home to find him covered in bruises and scratches. My grandmother was desperate for answers and went to see a renowned exorcist who lived in a nearby city. She begged him to help her grandson, and he agreed to perform an exorcism. The exorcism was a long and grueling process, but finally, the demon left Alex's body. My grandmother was overjoyed, but she couldn't shake off the feeling that the experience had changed her grandson forever. The exorcist told my grandmother that the demon was attracted to Alex because he was a vulnerable child. 
The exorcist also revealed that the demon had been feeding off of Alex's negative emotions, causing him to become more erratic and aggressive. He cautioned my grandmother to be watchful of Alex's behavior, as demons could return. After the exorcism, my grandmother noticed a marked improvement in Alex's behavior. He was no longer speaking in tongues or throwing things around. My grandmother was convinced that the demon was gone for good, but she continued to pray for her grandson's protection. Alex's behavior returned to normal, and he became a happy and healthy child once again. My grandmother was grateful for the help that she received and was convinced that it was through faith that her grandson had been saved. My grandmother remains convinced that Alex was possessed by a demon and that it was only through the power of faith that he was saved. She continues to pray for his protection and is grateful every day that he is healthy and happy. The experience had a profound effect on my grandmother and she became more devout in her faith. She also became more open to the existence of supernatural entities and continues to believe that there are things in this world that we cannot explain. Looking back on the experience, my grandmother remains convinced that Alex was possessed by a demon. She also believes that it was through faith that he was saved. The experience has strengthened her faith and has taught her to be more watchful of the signs of demonic possession. As I reflect on my grandmother's story, it leaves me with a sense of curiosity and wonders about the supernatural world. It makes me wonder what other unexplainable phenomena exist that we have yet to discover or understand. I didn't think my career choice would ever land me in the sights of something strange. Dangerous? Maybe. But I sure hadn't prepared myself for the outright bizarre experience I had at work. I've been a security guard for three years now. Sometimes that means patrolling the parking lot. Sometimes it means walking the building interior to deter shoplifters. It never means fighting monsters. But last year, one night tried to change that. I was working an overnight shift, monitoring the parking lot ahead of an early opening. It's a lonely shift. I always considered it the most boring, just driving around slowly with only my music playlist to keep me company. That night, boring very quickly went out the window. I saw some movement by the industrial-sized dumpsters around the back of the complex. We were having issues with vagrants raiding the containers. It was my job to talk them off of the premises so that the police didn't have to get involved. I crept toward the dumpsters slowly with my spotlight fixed on the large green structures. But now, the movement had stopped. Whatever figure I had seen in the darkness was gone. Unless the person had ducked into the dumpsters. I don't know why that suspicion possessed me so completely. I had to investigate. I parked the car and exited the vehicle, calling out as I searched for the vagrant. There was, of course, no response. When I knocked on the largest dumpster hoping to prompt an answer, something knocked back. It wasn't intelligible or coordinated. It sounded like an animal scurrying around instead of a man digging for discarded treasure. I didn't want to deal with an animal. But I needed to get it out of there, so I figured I could just open the lid to the dumpster and free the intruder on my own. I swallowed my nerves and summoned a bit of courage. I ended up using the ice scraper from my trunk to prop open the lid of the dumpster. I wedged it open about a foot and peeked inside. It wasn't an animal. It wasn't a man either. It was something between... I don't know. I didn't understand what I was looking at and I haven't dared try to understand it since. The creature filled almost the entire width of the dumpster. Its body was rippling with muscle. From the way it was hunkered down atop the dumpster's debris, I knew right away that it moved on all fours. It was the face that told me I wasn't looking at some feral dog. Its eyes were very human, and they looked sad, as if they were pleading with me. And although its face was stretched out into a canine snout, the eyes were still making a vivid expression. Frightened. I've never seen an animal make that face. I don't know of any animal with the capacity to feel we can. Maybe the fear we shared was making me hallucinate. Maybe I imagined those human features. We all do stupid things when we're scared. 
I know I did. I screamed, dropped the lid, and scrambled backward. My panic must have stirred the creature. When my back collided with the front end of my vehicle, the thing pulled itself out of the dumpster. It hoisted itself upright using its front arms. It glared at me and then tumbled out of the dumpster. In the spotlight, the beast's features were easier to make out. Its muscular body was covered in short, thin fur. Its mouth was filled with glistening, pointed teeth. Its stare had transformed from fear to fury. I guess that's what wild animals do. They fight back when they're scared. I hesitated, hoisting the ice scraper in between us. I didn't plan on fighting the creature off. I was trying to avoid the fight that threatened to break out between us. I hoped it would see me standing my ground and run away. It didn't. Instead, it tore toward me, running like its life depended on ending mine. I barely made it to the driver's side door. The beast's shoulder collided with the frame and slammed the door shut behind me. It thrashed against the car for a moment, swiping at the glass and metal with its clawed hands. I don't know how the glass held up, but I'm glad that it did. I watched the feral monster try to break into my car, all the while believing that I was doomed. I managed to call the police from the safety of the front seat. Before they arrived, the creature abandoned its goal. I watched it slink back into the darkness, but didn't dare step out of my car until the lot was filled with red and blue lights. The police didn't believe me. They accused me of every ignorant crime they could, from falsifying a report to wasting their time. When I showed them the dumpster, complete with a patch of fur from the creature itself, they ignored me. I thought speaking to their supervisor would be wise. It wasn't. They were even quicker to dismiss my claims and somewhat angry about my persistence. I couldn't have been the first person to see one of these things, right? The creature knew how to get into that dumpster. That means it's been doing it elsewhere, doesn't it? I couldn't help but imagine the poor local who found a monster rummaging through their own garbage. But the police could. They could imagine it because they took the reports, right? And they worked to silence them, at least if they went anything like mine. Maybe they were trying to avoid panic. I don't know. Next time I'm calling animal control, work has been a little more tense ever since. I definitely prefer working indoors. My playlists aren't strong enough to make me feel safe when I'm alone in a parking lot. I give the dumpsters a wide berth when I pass by. It's only a matter of time before it returns, I think. When it does, you won't find me investigating. I used to think people who claimed to have seen things were always on the wrong side of the crazy fence. Aliens, monsters, cryptids. I mean, if they exist, then where are they all hiding? Bigfoot, Loch Ness, Monster, aliens. The world isn't such a big place that all these things are hanging around with no real evidence. Well, I don't think that way anymore. I have my own story to tell, and it happened, in of all places, Queens, New York. I'm a patrol officer, still a rookie. I spend most of my nights walking down Jamaica Ave, breaking up bar fights and shooing off loiterers. More of a glorified security, really. Despite the city's bad rep, I've never seen anything more violent than a few broken bones or knife cuts. Plenty of overdoses thought, fortunately, only a few were fatal. I joined with the intent to protect and serve. I know that sentiment is slowly fading, but I truly believed I could make a difference. That's why when I was alone patrolling one night, I jumped at my chance to try to be a hero. I only had a few hours left in my shift when a woman shouted at me from across the street and dodged her way through traffic to rush over to me. Her English was a little broken, but I could understand that she was saying that she saw a woman dragged into an alley just up the block. She refused to come with me but gave me a rough description of the alleyway and nearby buildings. This is where I messed up. I should have called it in and asked for assistance. I wasn't even supposed to be alone, but I had let my partner cut out for an hour so he could go have dinner with his kids. Instead, I raced down the street feeling like John McClane and ready to save a woman's life. I wasn't prepared for what was about to happen. 
I reached the head of the alleyway and regained a small sense of clarity. I didn't know how many guys were waiting down this alleyway, or even if what the woman said had been true. I poked my head around the corner and could see that the alley was longer than I had thought. It looked like it ran a couple of hundred feet and terminated in a high chain-link fence. Rubbish bags and dumpsters lined both sides of it, and a lot of my vision was obscured. I slowly began a slow walk down the path, and after a few feet, I could hear a strange grunting coming from behind a large dumpster. Fearing the worst, I drew my pistol and quickened my pace. Just as I rounded the corner, I heard a snapping sound like a chicken bone being broken in half, and I was met with a sight that is forever branded into my memory. A woman lay sprawled out on the ground. She was bleeding from a trio of wounds on her thigh and shoulder, and someone was hunched over her, holding her left arm and obscuring it from my view. It looked like some filthy robe covered the whole guy, and the smell which I had originally chalked up to the trash was nauseatingly putrid. I shouted for the guy to stand up and turn around. Now! At the sound of my voice, he snapped away from the woman's body and ran over to the wall and put their back against it, facing me. This is when I finally saw its face. Its skin was sickly gray, flecked with splotches of olive. Its eyes were two thin strips of pupilless yellow. It had only a single slit for a nose and a pair of cracked lips. This thing didn't even look like it could be alive. It stared at me, obviously caught off guard by my sudden arrival. With my bravado lost, I tried to issue another order for the creature to get down on the ground, but it came out as a pathetic whimper. The creature must have sensed some momentary weakness in me, because after waiting a brief moment, it bared two rows of needle-thin teeth and launched itself at me from the wall. I don't even know when I had raised my pistol and my hands were shaking almost uncontrollably, but I let out two shots from my gun and I swear I saw both impacts on the thing's chest. It didn't slow it a bit. The last thing I saw was a dirty gray hand swinging towards my head and everything faded to black. I think I was only out for a few minutes. My cell phone was ringing loudly in my pocket and I got myself up. My head felt like a lightning bolt had gone through it, and it took a minute for everything to sink back in. Looking over and seeing the woman laid out on the ground hammered the scenario home. I ran over to her and thanked God she was still breathing but unconscious. Reality sank in on just how horrible this situation was, and I knew I needed to call it in. Within a few minutes, a bus arrived, as well as a handful of other officers and a detective. I received treatment for my head, and then I was asked a series of questions. Needless to say, both my partner and I were in a lot of trouble. I'm looking at a possible suspension for acting so rashly, and my partner is probably going to lose his job for being AWOL, both of which pale in comparison to what that woman experienced. She had several fractures on her legs and arms, and I knew that the wounds that I saw were bite marks. She was in rough shape but the hospital said she would make it through. As far as the thing that did it, well, the sketch artist had a rough time. I described it the best I could, even though they gave me some side-eye with my description, but I know that whatever it was, it wasn't human. I just hope someone catches that thing before it hurts someone else. I see a lot of strange stories that come out of New Mexico. It seems like every other day someone is seeing some kind of mythic creature or a UFO, chupacabra, etc. I used to think there was no way that all of these things existed in one place. Where would they all hide? Well, I think I sort of figured some of that out. I'm a mailman based out of Los Alamos. The post office works a little differently around here. Not everybody is huddled together in a few square miles. Folks are spread out over some pretty impressive distances, and they still need to get their mail. So every day I take a long drive out through the New Mexico desert to deliver bills and packages to the more far-flung residents. Last week I was out, about an hour away from what we would call the city, when I hit a patch of bad road and blew a tire. It was horrible timing. I was on my last delivery for the day, and it was late afternoon. 
It was going to be dark pretty soon, and the desert gets extremely cold at nighttime, even in the summer. Even worse, cell phone service is spotty around here, and the road ran along the base of a few hills, so of course my reception was zilch. My only options were to wait for a car to pass and hope they were willing to help or to hike up the hill and try to get a signal. Eventually, after I didn't report back, the service would send someone out to find me along my route. But that could take literally hours, and I didn't want to spend the night out here alone. My gas wouldn't last forever, so I chose to hike. Fortunately, I was geared up properly. Plenty of water and sturdy footwear. I could probably make it up and back before it got dark. I just hoped that I would get a signal once up top. It was looking like a 45-minute trek, so I started off and made my way about halfway up the hill when I decided to take a short rest and a water break. Sitting on a rock and taking a few sips from my bottle, I heard some odd sounds. It was a loud chittering. It almost reminded me of cicadas when I lived back east. There are all kinds of bugs out in the desert, but I've never heard anything with the sheer volume as this one. It seemed like it was coming from behind a rocky outcropping just short ways up the hill, directly in the path I had planned on walking. Looking around and not seeing any other route, I decided to just move slowly and see what it was. The thought never even entered my mind that I would soon see an abomination. I was maybe a dozen yards away from the boulder, chittering not ceasing when I stepped on a loose rock and lost my footing. I kicked up a small spray of dust and pebbles and slid down a few feet before catching myself. The chittering stopped and it skittered out from behind the boulder. It had to be five, maybe six feet tall. A thin, chitinous, dusty color body ending in a head like that of a grasshopper. Two large antennas sticking out from its crown. A pair of large pincers extended from its thorax, another smaller pair right beneath. It skittered quickly left, then right, then left again, stopping 20 feet away. I was overcome with absolute disgust and horror. This monster had stepped right from a sci-fi movie onto the hill in front of me. I was momentarily at a loss. I didn't know if running or fighting was the best option, but taking another look at its pinchers, I decided on the former. I walked slowly backward, mimicking its left-right movements. Initially, it stayed put as I began my slow retreat, and I doubled the distance between us. Then, in a sick instance of irony, my cell phone began to ring loudly. Its antennas snapped straight toward me, and then it burst into motion, skittering down the hillside. Making a split-second decision, I tossed myself down the hill, rolling, bashing, and tumbling my way down. I was getting torn up on my descent with dozens of scratches and scrapes. I hit my head twice and was afraid I was going to pass out, but eventually I hit the bottom of the hill near the roadside next to the mail van. Adrenaline kept me alert. I looked back up and could see the thing racing towards me, four stick-like legs pumping up and down. I only had a few seconds. I limped over to the van, threw open the door and jumped in, slamming it shut behind me, just as the thing scrambled onto the road. It ran right at the front of the vehicle, jumped onto the hood, and then the roof. I could hear its legs skittering across the metal roof, and then felt a series of impacts as it probably tried to punch its way through with its pinchers. If it decided to hit one of the glass windows, I couldn't just sit here and let the thing make its way in. It seemed sensitive to noise, so I made my decision. I leaned on the horn while simultaneously shouting as loud as I could and rocking back and forth as hard as possible. After a second, the creature fell off the roof of the vehicle, and I could see it land next to the van in the side view. It stood up shakily, cantering across the road wildly. As it got further from the van, it seemed to regain some sense of composure, and eventually, it rocketed off up the hill and out of view. I stayed put in the van for about two hours, not daring to leave its safety. Eventually, another car came along and gave me a lift back into town. Despite all the action, the van didn't receive any discernible damage and I even got paid a few hours of overtime. I decided not to tell anyone about my experience until now. I don't think anyone would believe me. I'm a police officer in Suffolk County, Long Island, New York. 
For those of you who don't know, the majority of Long Island is densely populated. It thins out a little more the further east you go, but for the most part, it's shoulder to shoulder up and down the island. That's not to say it's an horrible either. We have a multitude of parks, coastlines, and recreational areas that balance out the tightly packed townships. And it's in one of those nice little parks that this story takes place, Connetquat State Park in Oakdale. 3,400 acres of protected woodland and water. It's one of the premier trout fishing locations on the island and carries a fee just to even get through the gate. Most incidents are handled by the state park agencies, but from time to time we have need to enter the park. And that's what happened the other night. An abandoned car was called in along the side of the road on Sunrise Highway, apparently. It had been sitting there for several hours, and the county has a strict tow policy for abandoned vehicles, being that the major road was so narrow. I just had to go and get some info from the plates and wait for the tow truck. But when I got there, I noticed something odd. The passenger door was halfway open, not something you would have seen from the road. There was a splatter of crimson on the ground next to the door. It looked like blood. The blood wound away from the car in a trail, right up the park's fence line. Right where the blood trail terminated, a huge gash had been ripped open in the chain-link fence, and bits of torn clothing was caught on parts of the fence. I called in the anomaly, but backup would be delayed because of a violent incident that had happened a little way down the road, so I did something foolish and decided to go and investigate on my own. I still didn't know exactly what I was heading into, so I moved as quietly as possible through the park's forest. I knew the river curved close to this portion of the road and hoped that whomever I was looking for hadn't crossed over, or worse. After just a few minutes of movement, I could start to make out the noise of running water and knew that the river was only a few yards away. Then I heard a branch snap behind me. I turned quickly and came face to sight that nearly saw me vomit on the spot. A man stood before me in torn and bloodied clothing. The bottom half of his jaw was missing as if completely torn away. His single remaining eye stared wildly at me. I rushed over to him and caught him just as he collapsed to the ground. I had basic medical response training, but this was well out of what I was capable of tending to. A dozen cuts ran the length of his torso, and a chunk of flesh was missing from his right arm. It was amazing that the man was still alive, let alone walking around. The options racing through my mind were cut short by a bizarre noise coming from the river at my rear. Some kind of inhuman chittering and chattering, like the high-pitched voices of children. Hearing the sound, the man began to tremble uncontrollably, and I lost my grip on him. I heard the noise of his skull splitting open as his head cracked against a rough-edged stone. Caught between the otherworldly noise and the sight of a man's death, I wheeled once again toward the river to see what was next in this nightmare sequence of events. From the banks rose two tall figures, nearly half again the size of a normal man. Their faces were set back in deep obsidian hoods so as not to be seen. Each of their left hands appeared to be human, but their rights extended into foot-long scythe-like blades. Their inane chattering grew louder as they strode toward me, and a sick fear erupted in my stomach. I pulled my firearm from my holster, and without the presence of mind to command them to stop, I fired right at them. The shots seemed to pass right through them, except for the last one which burst straight through one of the sickly eyes. The creature let out a wild scream, pulling its human hand to its face while lashing out wildly with its bladed arm. I fired at the other creature just as it burst into motion bolting towards me. Two shots, and then a click. I turned and ran. The horror behind me drove me to run haphazardly through the dark forest, and I hoped that I was heading back in the direction I came. I could hear the creature beating the ground behind me emitting its high-pitched screeching. The pursuit lasted for several minutes until ahead of me, I saw a blue and red strobe light. The road was close by and there were other officers there. I ran all the harder and nearly slammed into the chain link fence. I glanced over my shoulder quickly and couldn't see the thing anywhere, grabbed onto the fence and nearly threw myself over the top of it. 
The officer must have seen me jumping over because he wheeled his car around right on the road and ran it up onto the shoulder just beside me. It was a man I knew, and once he saw it was me, he called for paramedics and backup. I'll cut out all the follow-up. Long story short, neither the man's body nor either of the creatures was recovered or even seen. The vehicle was still there and the blood trail, but not even canine units could locate anything outside of that. I've been remanded to an intense psychiatric evaluation and placed on paid administrative leave. I've been told that the stress of the job has just caught up to me and that some time off would be good for my mental health, but that's just their polite way of saying I'm crazy and shouldn't be carrying a weapon. I know I'm not crazy. I know that those two things or whatever they were are still out there. And there could even be more. Back when I was a young man, I was a Marine Reservist. I had always wanted to contribute and be in the service some way, but I didn't want to be a full-time active duty Marine. Reservists go through the same type of training, but it's very much a part-time role. I had to commit to serving one weekend a month, plus two weeks a year. But my lifestyle was flexible, and I got to live in my own home and act like a civilian most of the time. Of course, I could be mobilized to active duty if there was ever a national emergency or something like that. I'm not sure how amphibious training is done now, but there was this one weekend where we had to participate in an amphibious landing exercise, and we took an excursion out to a lake in northern Georgia. We were going to be doing some amphibious assault stuff and a training patrol. It was the only time I ever remember doing this type of thing somewhere other than on a military installation. But this time we were using a public lake. It seemed strange to me, and I didn't know how that decision was made. But apparently the local police and residents had been informed so we supposedly wouldn't be freaking anybody out. This was taking place at around midnight. We arrived at the lake and got loaded up on the Zodiacs, which are inflatable boats. We rowed for about 30 minutes and then stopped and slipped into the water. We swam to our designated spot and stashed our swim gear. Then we outfitted ourselves in our armored vests and other patrolling gear. By then it was about one in the morning. We started patrolling toward our objective and realized that we were within sight of some houses off in the distance. We couldn't see the houses clearly, but we could see light coming off of them over the hill. We could hear people having a loud party. The sound of the music was drifting over to us. We were plenty far away, but it was pretty wild to think what a sight we would be if anyone saw us. A six-man team with our rucksacks and all our gear tramping through the woods. It might be hard to imagine a public lake as being a suitable training spot, but I'm telling you, it was rough going. There were vines growing everywhere and we kept getting tripped up. We were trying to be quiet, but it's challenging to be groping around in the dark when you're carrying a big sniper rifle. I remember the guy in front of me had a training rocket across the top of his rucksack. For some reason, I kept expecting it to fall on the ground in front of me. It felt surreal out there. There wasn't much moonlight and the terrain was treacherous. The vines were relentless and we were making way more noise than we wanted to. We kept going until we were in an isolated tract of woods. We must have been at least a mile from any house or road at that point. We had reached the place where we were going to build our hide site. A hide site is built from whatever you can use in your surroundings. A well-built hide site can provide an incredible place for concealment. Once we got it done to our satisfaction, we settled in. I was sitting up against my rucksack planning to try to get a little sleep. I was dozing off when I thought I heard feet shuffling through the leaves. I immediately snapped completely awake. Everyone else heard it too. The sound was coming from behind us. I heard this weird flapping noise and had the sense that something had flown up into the black walnut tree about 20 feet away. But that flapping sound was substantial. It wasn't like any ordinary bird or anything. Then before we knew it, our hide site was being pelted with black walnuts. Who would do such a thing? I mean, we all assumed it had to be some kind of bizarre animal. Everyone started quietly gathering their stuff up in case we had to move away from the area. Our team leader cautiously stuck his head out and shone his flashlight toward the tree. 
When we heard him gasp, we all froze. I had to see what it was, and when I looked, I couldn't believe it. It was a winged creature, but it had a human-like body and was standing in the tree like some kind of demon. My first thought was that it was someone dressed up in a costume. The black wings were huge, like the whole length of its body. It wasn't close to Halloween yet. My mind was going through all these contortions trying to figure it out. The thing made this weird high-pitched sound and glared at us with its red eyes. I swore it had to be a costume because that sort of thing doesn't exist. This all happened in just a few seconds. I raised my rifle and was about to order it to drop to the ground when it shrieked and flew backwards out of the tree into the dark behind it at like 60 miles per hour. My jaw just dropped. All of us were just stunned. Nothing human could move like that. It was like it was wearing a jetpack or something, but it was completely silent. Honestly, none of us knew how to react to that. None of our hours of training had ever included a vision like that. It seemed supernatural. I'm pretty sure no one rested at all that night. We completed our mission, but we did not really have a feeling of accomplishment. We felt a huge sense of discomfort. We realized how impossible it was to truly be prepared for everything. I was a police officer in the north woods of Minnesota. Given the area, the number of vehicle collisions with wildlife was quite high. Standard procedure was to make sure the occupants of the vehicle were all accounted for and received proper medical attention, report damages to the vehicle or other property, and dispatch the injured animal if necessary. Now nobody calls an ambulance when they run over a raccoon, but we have deer, elk, moose, and bear up here that can cause some real damage. The two worst animal collisions I'd ever seen were between a bear and a moose. Just last summer, I was on the scene of a driver who hit a male black bear with a Dodge Ram. The truck was totaled, but luckily the driver survived with few injuries. Moose are probably the worst, especially if you're in a car or a small SUV. More often than not, the vehicle strikes the moose at the knees, and it falls on top and crushes the car. Most people don't survive that. Accidents with white-tailed deer are by far the most common and they vary from totaling the car to getting away with a scratch or a broken headlight if it's not a direct impact. If I get a call about a vehicle collision with a moose, I know it's most likely going to be bad. If it's a deer, it could be anything. And after what I saw on that cold October night, I do mean it can be anything. I was called, along with an ambulance, about a vehicle collision with a deer. The dispatcher said there was only one occupant in the vehicle, and she was reported to be mostly uninjured. When I got there, I saw it was a teenage girl. She had a few cuts and bruises from the airbag deploying, but seemed medically all right otherwise. She was pretty shaken up, but most people are after a vehicle accident, so I didn't think anything of it at the time. Her vehicle, a newer model SUV, was totaled. The front end was completely smashed in and the front windshield was shattered. The front right tire was barely attached. To be honest, I was surprised the girl didn't have any other injuries. I noticed what looked like bits of muscle tissue and deer hair on the front of her vehicle, or what was left of the front of her vehicle. I didn't see the deer lying anywhere in the ditch, but I didn't imagine it could have survived an impact like that. There was something strange, though. The whole front of the car smelled like decomp. The accident happened only a few moments before, and yet the pieces of deer smelled already rotten. It wasn't the heat from the engine searing the hair either, it was something else. It smelled like something that had been dead for weeks. I was on a wellness check once for an older gentleman who unfortunately passed away before we arrived. The medical examiner gauged him to have been dead at least a week, maybe a week and a half. If you've ever smelled a decomposing body before, it sticks with you. And that's exactly what this smelled like. I looked around in the ditches for some rotten roadkill to explain the stench, but I didn't find anything. I pulled one of the EMTs away and asked if they could smell it too, and they said the scene had smelled like that since they had arrived. The driver looked like she would be okay, and that was the important thing right now. When I talked to her, she didn't appear to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. 
She overheard me talking to the EMT about the smell and claimed it suddenly came out of nowhere right before she saw the deer in the road. This particular stretch of road was right at a blind corner, so she didn't see the deer until it was too late. Hit it head on at 45 miles per hour. When I asked some more questions, she said the deer looked sick. Its fur was long and matted up, longer than a normal deer's fur usually was. She said it was skinny and she could see its bones, literally see its bones. She said it had patches of skin missing and she could see its white rib bones poking out past the muscle. It must have been an already injured deer, probably with gangrene. Most likely had been hit by a vehicle before and suffered some pretty severe damage. It's not a common situation, but it's not unheard of. It was either that or else the deer was suffering from chronic wasting disease. Those theories went right out the window when she described its face. She said it looked like a skull, white with no hair on it at all. It had antlers like an elk and, get this, no eyes. They were just empty black sockets. I started to question whether this girl might actually be on some type of drug because the whole thing sounded insane. I started looking around for the deer. We were surrounded by woods on both sides of the road, but I doubted this thing could have gone far. I didn't even step off the road before I noticed the outline of white antlers among the trees. The girl was right, they looked just like elk antlers, but the animal didn't appear large enough to be an elk. It was looking directly at me, as if it had been watching me the entire time. I couldn't see its face in the shadows of the forest. The smell of decomp grew stronger, and though I didn't know exactly what I was looking at, I knew there was something terribly wrong here. I pointed my flashlight at the woods. I only saw the creature for a second. The girl's description of it was accurate. Its face was a skull. No eyes. Just black holes in its head. Skinny and matted. I shined the light directly at its face. It tilted its head like a dog does when it hears a strange noise, like it was curious. It rustled its antlers in the brush. I thought about shooting it, but if this thing survived that accident, I wasn't sure a gun could take it down and I didn't want to find out the hard way if I was wrong. I told the EMTs to hurry up and stay inside the ambulance. They must have thought I was crazy. I waited there for the tow truck after the ambulance left. The creature stayed there the entire time, just watching. The only part of it I could see were the outline of its antlers. It kept to the shadows. I put collision with a deer on my report. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't imagine anyone would believe me otherwise. I haven't seen anything like it again, but I've heard other stories from the area that make me think I wasn't crazy that night. I ended up getting lost on a hike in the Arizona desert. The area I was hiking in had several canyons and deep gorges. It was a beautiful location, but the trails weren't very well marked, and I must have got turned around. I didn't get a signal on my phone, so I couldn't use the GPS to pinpoint my location. It was getting dark, and I was almost out of water. The only flashlight I had was the one on my phone, and I didn't want to use it for fear of draining the battery. It wasn't a great situation, but I was afraid it was going to get much worse if I didn't find my way out soon. I wandered around for what must have been another hour with no luck in finding my way to a trail. It was dark by that point, and I was settling into the idea that I would have to spend the night out there with no shelter. I didn't even have a jacket with me since it was so warm during the day. But the desert can get cold at night. Very cold. I know it was stupid of me not to pack at least some basic survival gear, but I didn't, and that was the situation I was in. My biggest worry was the cold and my lack of water. I hadn't even thought about the possibility of wild animals until I heard something moving through some bushes nearby. I used the light on my phone and shined it toward the direction of the sound, and to my delight, I saw another person. I shouted at the person to tell them where I was, and then I started explaining how I ended up lost out here, but I stopped midway through my story because the person wasn't responding to me at all. They were just standing there, staring. At that moment I knew something was weird, but I didn't know what it was yet. I waved my arm and asked if they could hear me. 
The figure waved back but didn't speak. So now I was not only worried about being cold, lost, and thirsty, but also about being trapped alone in the middle of the desert with a lunatic. I couldn't get a good look at the person from as far away as I was, so I approached them. I tried talking, but they still didn't respond. But they didn't make any attempt to leave either. They just let me approach. When I finally got close enough to see who I was talking to, I about fainted from shock. It wasn't a person at all. It stood like a person. It looked like a person from a distance, but it wasn't like any person I had ever seen. It was covered in dark brown or black hair all over its body, except for its face, feet, and hands. Those were brown or tan colored. Its skin was thick and leathery. Its face looked more like an ape than a person, but its eyes, its eyes looked human. I screamed when I realized what it was, and then I ran. I didn't know where I was running to. I just wanted to get away from that creature. I was already lost, but I didn't want to get attacked by a monster out here. I don't imagine my body would ever be found if something happened to me. To say I was terrified was an understatement. I ran maybe half a mile into the night, and I thought maybe I was safe. I rested there for a moment. The sky was clear, so I tried to memorize the locations of the stars. Maybe I could use them to navigate my way out of here. I drank the last bit of my water and tried to breathe for a minute, but my moment of calm didn't last. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shape moving towards me. It was the creature. I tried to evade it with no avail. I set out running again, but every time I stopped to catch my breath, it was there. I didn't know what it wanted, but I knew it couldn't be good. I was nearly exhausted, but it was either run or end up caught by this thing. So I ran. I don't quite remember what happened after that. I'm pretty sure I collapsed from exhaustion coupled with lack of food and water. The next thing I remember was waking up on the ground near the trailhead. It was still dark, but I could see the morning sun peeking over the horizon. I was freezing, but some weeds and shrubbery had been laid over me. I didn't know what to think. I could see my car in the parking lot. It was the only one there. I hurried to get up and get to the car so I could turn on the heat, but as I moved the plants off of me and dusted off my clothes, I noticed footprints in the dirt around where I had been sleeping. The footprints were massive and looked like those of bare human feet. I knew it was that creature. It must have carried me here and put those weeds over me so I wouldn't freeze. I was so afraid of that thing when I first saw it and here it was only trying to help me. I don't know how I would react if I ever saw another one, but I know the one I did encounter wasn't a monster, and to be honest, I'm thankful it found me out there. I don't know how I get myself into these situations. I mean, I don't even like to go camping. So many times I've tried and I just end up being cold and wet and uncomfortable. Also, I hate to admit it, but I barely know what to do with myself anymore when I don't have an internet connection. But I don't mind renting a cabin on occasion. I've found plenty of them that have electricity and even Wi-Fi sometimes. But I have this loyalty to a couple of my childhood friends, and they love camping, especially the kind of camping where you have to hike in to get to your spot. So every once in a while I let them talk me into it. They convinced me to go with them during one of our college breaks. Maybe it was because I was the one with the fancy tent. I had inherited it from my brother when he upgraded to an even bigger one. He had two kids and a wife, so he needed a lot of room. My friends had their eye on this place in the Great Smoky Mountains. The plan was for a three-day trip with a lot of hiking in and camping and hiking out. It really was too cold for my liking, but things were going okay the first day. It was a sunny day in spite of the temperature. We did plenty of drinking that first night and had a blast laughing and talking. When I was laying in the tent that night looking up at the stars, it was almost pleasant. But the next morning it was cloudy and kept raining on and off. I was trying to pack up and everything was getting soggy and I was getting grouchy. If it had been raining steadily, I could probably have convinced the others to shorten the trip. 
but the sun kept peeking out and pretending like it was going to actually turn into a nice day. The rain turned into a mist that my friends thought was cool and kept saying how it would be fine. But during the afternoon, the temperature really dropped and I couldn't even pretend to be having fun. I stopped walking and said I wasn't going any further. And since I had the only tent, they could either stay with me or go on without a shelter. We got the tent up and a fire going to dry out our clothes. At least we had more wine to raise our spirits. And the rain was holding off. We were trying to get into a jovial mood, but one of my friends started acting a little weird and nervous and kept looking off into the woods. It was starting to make me feel nervous too. I asked her what she was looking at, but she just said she felt a little off and kind of creeped out. Well, that didn't help my mood and I got paranoid. The Great Smoky Mountains are known for having plenty of black bears. I had heard they were mostly harmless, especially if their cubs weren't threatened. I wasn't interested in taking any chances, though. And there were plenty of other things that could be hiding in the woods. We decided that since the weather had been so wet lately, it wasn't likely that anything would catch on fire. So we left the fire burning a little and went into the tent. It still wasn't raining, so we left the tent flap a little unzipped in order to keep an eye on the fire. I was really sleepy, though, so I guess I dozed off right away. But it seemed like only a few minutes had gone by, and I jolted out of my sleep and sat straight up. I thought for sure I heard something moving outside the tent. I looked at my friends, and they were wide awake, too. We looked out at the glow of the fire. The embers had burned down really low. I was straining my eyes, and I thought I could make out some antlers just outside the tree line. I wanted to feel relief at the thought that it was only a deer. But for some reason, that sight made me feel ice cold to the core of my being. It made absolutely no sense. I had no fear of deer. It looked like it was stepping a little closer toward us, and when I saw the shape emerge, I was horrified. It couldn't be a deer because it was standing upright and it seemed seven or eight feet tall. I wanted to scream or cry, but instead I just shut down. I saw these yellow eyes come glowing out of the darkness, and they seemed to be embedded in the skull of a deer. I had this weird thought that some devil creature had stolen the deer skull and was wearing it for its own evil purposes. There was a terrible smell of rotten flesh that drifted over to us, and we looked at each other like this was the end. When I looked at that thing, it actually seemed like it was dead. Like some rotting corpse that was somehow walking around. It looked like it had tattered flesh hanging off of it. But the worst part was how it made me feel hollowed out and I had the sense that I was possessed with a demonic hunger that could never be appeased. What happened then was so weird. We all spontaneously took hands and closed our eyes and started to pray. Let me tell you, there wasn't one religious bone in any of our bodies. I hadn't been in a church since I was 12 years old. My one friend looked and started describing how she could see a luminous, protective light surrounding our tent. She was sure it was an impenetrable light through that evil could not enter. We must have stayed in that circle together for 20 minutes. And eventually, the desolate feeling withdrew and everything was back to normal. I don't know what more to say. I'm a contract logger and have an interesting story regarding something my crew and I experienced last summer in Alaska. I was in the area for a three-month contract. I'd been working for my boss for a few years, so had a pretty good thing going. And I was, and still am, close to a handful of guys on the crew. Once all the paperwork was figured out, I headed north on a flight with two other guys who live in California near me. We see each other regularly and usually get called in on these jobs together. Their names are Jed and Chuck. Both have about 10 years on me, but my dad and granddad were also loggers, so it's in my blood, and they respect that. We flew out to meet our boss and the rest of the crew, about 15 people total including two greenhorns who were training on skids. I'm a skidder operator myself and was slotted to do just that on this job. 
The first day we just settled into the lodgings we'd been given by the forestry service and the next day we went out to check out the acreage. We were out in the Tongass in southeast Alaska, an area that's been logged for centuries. Our boss went over the plans with us for how to handle the layout of the land and what to take down first. It was pretty cut and dry and we were going to be out there from June to late August. Perfect time to be in Alaska since that's about the height of summer with the best weather, so I was also looking forward to exploring as much as I could. The land we were working was pretty straightforward with only a small rise to the west. Nothing I couldn't handle on the skitter. Jed also works a skitter and Chuck is a faller, one of the guys who actually cuts down the trees. He's also a climber as needed, which is important to this story. About two weeks into the job, one of the green guys injured his ankle when a log rolled onto it, and Chuck had to replace him for a bit as a climber. Climbers get up high and lob off the limps at the top to make it safer to take down the rest of the tree. The view, especially in Alaska, has to be amazing, but I have a problem with heights, so it's not an option for me. He was up on a Sitka spruce checking his harness before making cuts when he suddenly stopped and called down on the radio. I can see something heading this way from the east, he reported, which was unusual considering the amount of noise we were making with saws and machines. East of where we were was a slight ridge, and Chuck explained that the animal was walking near the edge of the ridge but still back in the trees. Our boss, Frank, said not to worry about it. It wasn't in the area we were logging, and it would surely be scared away by the noise. Chuck got back to work, and I was dragging a load of trunks up to the landing. About a minute later, he got back on the radio to report that the animal was getting closer along the ridge. Jose, another climber who was over on another spruce, reported the same. He had a clearer view of the animal and relayed down that it was white. Jed got excited thinking it might be a spirit bear, an all-white black bear that is very rare to see. But within seconds, Jose got on the radio again and sounded scared this time. Frank tried to calm him down, but Jose started climbing down immediately. Chuck stayed up in his spruce but was quiet. I radioed up on another channel that we sometimes use just to chat and asked if he was okay. It took a few tries before he finally responded. I don't think it's a bear, he said in a serious voice. It's too big. He was quick to get back on the other radio and have a talk with Frank, confirming that whatever it was was staying along the ridge. Frank gave in and called lunch early. Jose was freaked out at this point, but Chuck was still calm. He told Jed and me that he was absolutely sure it wasn't a bear at all. Jose agreed and said it had to be a Yeti. I laughed at first, but when Chuck didn't laugh, I asked if that was what he thought it was. He said that while he hadn't gotten a clear look at it because of the distance, it did carry itself like an ape. That was hard to argue with since apes and bears move very, very differently. Both men claimed that it had been walking on two legs, bipedally along the ridgeline, and kept stopping as if it was trying to see what we were doing. When lunch ended, Chuck got right back up in the spruce. He radioed down that the creature wasn't anywhere that he could see. I never got a look at it, but from how Chuck and Jose reacted, it sounds like they saw something they hadn't been expecting to see in the area. Or anywhere. I wouldn't be totally surprised if we found out it was a Yeti or something like it, because the Tongass National Forest area is huge, basically a little over 16 million acres. That would also explain why whatever it was hadn't been scared off by the sounds, and could have been drawn by them instead, not knowing what they were. Throughout the rest of our time there Chuck and the other climbers, there were four on the team in total, kept an eye out, but never saw the creature again. If it was a Yeti or Bigfoot or something similar, it probably got the message that it shouldn't be in the area and headed off in another direction. Since then, I keep an extra eye out on our jobs, but I haven't experienced anything that strange again, even in the deepest woods. So I am not a believer in the supernatural or things like Bigfoot or anything like that. Or at least I wasn't. But I might be now. A few weeks days ago I saw something and I'm going crazy trying to figure it out. I think I might have hallucinated it or maybe mistook a common animal for this thing. 
I don't know, but I feel like I'm losing my mind. A few weeks ago, I was out taking a walk late at night, and it was late, like 10 at night. I live in a decent area on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio, but it's a little messy right now because of some improvements with some new houses being built. Across from where my street comes off of the main road is a series of abandoned buildings that are in the process of being demolished. Behind these buildings is a wooded area. Wildlife in our area largely consists of deer, birds, and a few stray cats, so nothing crazy. I'm familiar with the layout in the area. I like walking there because it's calm and quiet, away from the highways and everything. So, I'm walking around like I usually do, sometimes kicking a brick or stone, when I hear something to the right of me, where the woods are. It sounded like some bricks, or something fell off a wall which could have been caused by the wind or a stray, so I honestly wasn't concerned. At least, I wasn't concerned until I heard the noise again, but this time it sounded closer to me. Then. I had this feeling like I was in a fishbowl, like I was being watched. I was really freaked out but tried to keep myself calm and just kept thinking there had to be a logical explanation. Like I said, we don't have any notable wildlife to be afraid of, and I go here all the time. I take out my phone and turn on the flashlight and head towards the noises. I hear it again but this time it's further from me, which seemingly confirmed, in the weird way that my brain was working, that this was a stray cat or something. I feel less scared as I maneuver around debris and cinder blocks. It was cold outside, so I was trying to walk as quickly as I could. I reach the tree line and I see this thing. It looked like some sort of human-like creature, like Gollum from Lord of the Rings almost. Its skin was pale and white, like a birch tree. It was crawling on all fours and was completely naked. When I shined my light on it, it froze and looked at me. It had large black eyes that seemed empty but intelligent, like it understood what was happening. It even tilted its head, as though it were confused or curious. It had no nose, and its mouth... Its mouth was like a slit carved into its face. After what felt like forever, it just ran into the woods. This thing looked so human, but so alien at the same time, and it moved impossibly fast. I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen something that size move that fast before. I felt nauseous and basically ran home, which was only about 10 minutes away from the spot. I couldn't sleep that night because I just kept seeing this ghoulish human creature. I didn't say anything to anyone because I was afraid. What if they thought I was crazy? What if I had just mistaken a dog or something, and my brain was too stressed to comprehend what I seen? So the next night, I went out again around the same time. This time, though, I do bring a knife with me just in case. I made my way down to the tree line and waited for it to come out again, but it never came. I did this for a few days, each day disappointed. I eventually stopped because at this point I was positive I had imagined it. While I was driving home from work one night, this would have been about a week after the initial encounter, when something ran in front of my car. I slammed on the brakes. In the middle of the road, staring right at me was the creature. I get chills just thinking about it. Its eyes were so empty and calculating, it was as though it understood that I was in the car, as if it remembered me. It wasn't frozen like a deer who usually looks startled or confused. It looked as though it chose to be there. Then it stood up. I swear this is the creepiest thing I have ever seen. It stood up and its arms and legs were long, unusually so, and just looked at me. It must have been six feet tall. I felt as though it were staring into my soul. I nearly peed my pants. My heart was racing, and I'd never been this scared in my life. I watched as it walked off into the tree line. It walked off like a human. At some point, I found it in me to start driving again. My hands were shaky, and I felt sick and weak as I started driving. In the side mirrors, I seen it again, galloping alongside my car. I mean, it was running on all fours like a dog, and I was going maybe 10 or 15 miles per hour at that point, so that's pretty fast. As it ran, it made this weird noise, like a clicking sound. I sped up until I could no longer see it. I told some people, and they think I'm crazy. I think I'm crazy. Some people believe me, but I have no evidence that this thing exists or that I saw it. 
There's no tracks, nothing, and I feel that I can't rest until I know what that creature is. I was investigating a case from a local ranch complaining of dead cattle. If a rancher loses an animal to predation, they are supposed to report it. A big part of my job is trying to minimize the conflict between ranchers and wildlife. I take it pretty seriously. It's a big part of why I got into this line of work. I want to help preserve nature best I can, but I don't like to see ranchers lose their livestock either. This particular situation was an odd one. The rancher reported several missing cattle as well as several injured ones that he was forced to euthanize. The injuries on the cattle didn't make sense. There were broken legs and head trauma. Not something I would expect from a bear, a wolf, or a mountain lion. The cattle would have scratches and sometimes puncture wounds on their sides, but it wasn't severe enough damage to cause death. I took his reports, but I didn't have much in the way of solutions for him, at least not until I could figure out what the perpetrator was. I told him to call me the next time he found a dead or injured cow in the pasture. I wanted to look at it myself. I got there, and just as he had described, there was a cow lying dead in the pasture. The rancher told me three others had gone missing that night, but there was no sign of them. I examined the cow. There was dried blood originating from the nose and mouth. The cow's skull had been caved in on one side. Three of its four legs were most certainly broken, and there were what looked like claw marks on either side of its back. I thought I might have some answers after seeing the cow myself, but I didn't. The cow hadn't been eaten and predators that go to that much effort to kill a cow definitely don't leave a meal like this. The rancher and I drove around the fence line, looking for some place a large predator could get in. I will say wolves and lions can easily get under and over fences, but this didn't look like the work of either. We thought maybe there was a break in the fence and an aggressive bison got in. That's about the only animal out there that could do damage like that. But the fence was intact. I didn't have much advice for the rancher other than to set up trail cams. It took a couple of months to finally catch something on one of the trail cams. The rancher showed up to my station with the photos he got off the trail cam, and things made even less sense than before. There were no signs of any predator. It looked like the cow fell straight out of the sky. That would explain the head trauma and the broken legs, but it didn't explain how the cow got in a situation where it was falling from the sky. All of us in the station were huddled around these photos, trying to make sense of it. One of the rangers takes a quick look and said he knew what it was. He said it was a thunderbird. The natives talk about them, have for years. Most people think they don't exist anymore, but they do. Granted, there aren't very many of them left. You'll see them right before a storm or right after. Nobody believed him. Most of us thought it was a joke. After that, somebody claimed it could have been an alien abduction and everybody laughed except for the rancher. Still, the situation bothered me. I couldn't come up with a logical explanation as to what exactly was happening to this rancher's cattle. I thought about it for a couple of weeks and couldn't come up with a damn thing. I ended up driving out to the rancher's property to talk with him again. Not that I thought I was going to find answers this time. There was a for sale sign at the end of the driveway when I arrived. The rancher said he was moving his whole operation. The cows weren't safe there, and he didn't feel safe anymore either. I had really hoped he hadn't latched on to the idea of aliens because I knew of some old farmers who had, and they were both nutcases. And then he showed me a photo. He said that after that ranger said what he said about the Thunderbird, the farmer looked back at all his reports of missing or dead cattle. Then he checked the weather records. The incidents with the cows lined up with thunderstorms. During the next thunderstorm, he drove out to the pasture, and he finally saw the creature harming his cows. He showed me the photo. It was hard to make out and against the backdrop of the storm, but it looked like a giant bird. A bird as big as a bus. It was unbelievable. The photo wasn't great quality. I tried to zoom in on its face, but it was difficult to see. It had a reptilian quality to it. It almost looked like a cross between an eagle and a dinosaur. I didn't know what to say. 
I didn't have any ideas on how to get rid of this thing or even what exactly it even was. The rancher said he didn't want to live anywhere near it. He said he couldn't sleep at night knowing it was out there. And I don't blame him. I never saw the bird myself, but I dug into it a bit. It seems there are other stories out there like the ranchers. Stories of farm animals with blunt trauma and broken legs. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens. I'm assuming the birds were intending to eat the cows, but for whatever reason, they slipped out of their grasp. That's the only explanation I can come up with. Oh man, this is an odd story. I tell this story at least once a year. Luckily, I was not the only person to experience what happened. My sister and two of my friends were there as well, and they can completely back me up. This happened a few years ago. We were getting ready for a big Halloween party. It wasn't on Halloween. It was the weekend before. We usually throw a big party, though, as Halloween is big in our family. We're of Irish descent, so anything related to the Irish or ancient Celts like Halloween, we blow it up big time. We spent most of the day hanging decorations throughout the house. We had already hung lights and put some stuff up outside, you know, inflatables and a couple of dummies. One was a scarecrow sitting on the bench outside. We had a witch. They turned out great. I went and picked up a couple of kegs and set them up outside near the fire pit in big tubs of ice. We had two big picnic tables, and we left the trampoline up as well, and I brought out the foosball table too. My sister set up another long table with beer pong set up. Downstairs in the basement is a pool table, so we had a lot of stuff covered. We'd done this before. I also had just bought a bunch of firewood, and I made a giant stack next to the pit outside. People started coming over around six or seven. The first couple of hours, we had a ton of people show up, but you know as the night progresses, people come and go to other parties, they might come back later. The later it got, the smaller the party got, until eventually around midnight, there were maybe 15 or 20 of us left. Some were in the house, some outside around the fire. We have a pretty big property, not huge, but it goes back away, and there's a tree line at the very back that leads to a park. At one point in the night, we heard something fall over in our shed, and the noise freaked a few people out. So a few of my friends and I went to investigate, we used our phones as flashlights and walked back to the shed. The shed is about halfway between our house and the back of the property near the trees. We get back there and I slowly open the door. We flash our lights and look inside. A bunch of stuff had fallen. Tools, yard equipment, they were all over the place. It was weird but made sense and explained why it was so loud. The only way you can get into the shed is through the one door and it was shut when we walked up to it. One of my friends suggested that things were probably not as secure as we thought, and they then dragged the rest of the stuff down when they fell from the wall, or something like that. I closed the door and we walked back to the fire pit, and just forget about it. A few more hours go by, and more people start to leave. It's around two in the morning at this point. I walk with two of my friends to their car and we hear something shuffling in the dark. We stop and I shine my phone at my friend's Jeep. Something moves next to the wheel of the Jeep. I turn the light off to see if it comes out again and just stand there with my friends for a few minutes. I turn the light back on and shine it towards the wheel. Standing there is a little humanoid thing and it ducks back toward the Jeep wheel. We all saw it, but no one could get a good look at it at first. So I turned the light back off and we quietly move forward a little bit. I turn the light back on, and the thing is still there. It had big shiny eyes and little ears. Its arms and legs were thin and long. I could see one of its little hands holding onto the tire. It seemed to have six slender fingers gripping into the grooves of the tread. It was shaking, and then one of my friends began to freak out, and the thing disappeared. We ran over to where it was, but it was gone. We spent the next hour and a half looking all over the property for any signs of the little guy. We even looked next door on both of my neighbor's property as well. We never found the thing. We looked over the area around the Jeep as well. 
There weren't any footprints or handprints on the Jeep or the tires. That's when we remembered the shed. We moved quietly back to the shed and threw the doors open. There was nothing but the mess that we saw earlier. We then thought about going back into the trees, but decided it would probably just be harder to look for something back there at this time of night. My friends and my sister helped me go over the area again in the morning. That's when we began to find some stuff. Not near the Jeep, but next to my sister's car, there was a weird little pile of acorns. Only about four or five of them kind of stacked next to her tire. And then we found a wad of string under my friend's Ford Taurus. There was about two feet of it, weighted up in a ball. We brought the things into the house and showed my other friends who didn't believe us when we told them the night before. They still didn't believe us. They thought we were messing with them because Halloween was coming up. I decided to sit outside at night for the next two weeks. Two of my friends who saw it came over and hung out outside with me. We never did see anything, though. Sometimes when I find weird stuff, it reminds me of that night. My sister never wants to talk about it. My friends and I who saw it, though, have told a few people. Most don't believe what we're saying. I don't know what we saw or if it will ever come back, but I think about it often. Have any of you ever heard of a creature that fits this description? I work for a security firm, a very professional one. We aren't like Blackwater or any of those other mercenary bands, but we have our share of ex-military and law enforcement, even a few combat vets. We're thoroughly trained and, depending on the contract, considerably well-armed. A few months ago, I was assigned to a nondescript building on the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia. We operate all along the East Coast. We didn't receive any details on what or who we were securing. That's how I knew it was a government job. Private contractors usually get hired when the government wants to keep something under wraps. Half a dozen guys in generic black clothing draw a lot less attention than fully uniformed military. We were better trained than 80% of them anyway. Patrol patterns, access controls, and screenings were what we were responsible for. The building was large. It seemed like a repurposed hospital, but updated. The property was expensive, but it had an eight-foot-high chain-link fence, and the grounds were under constant CCTV surveillance. We didn't find any of this the least bit odd. Pretty common practice, really, in this line of work. There was a roster of about 30 personnel who routinely worked in the building. I recognized all of them and knew a few well enough to have brief conversations, but it was always idle chit-chat. None of them ever revealed any information about the site, and I never asked. Until recently, we had hardly received any visitors, the odd official or medical personnel. But now, well over the last two weeks, it's been steady. From military higher-ups, doctors, and various government agencies. I was typically on perimeter patrol and preferred it that way. Fresh air, no matter how cold, always kept me on my toes. And that's what I was doing the night it happened. The building had been a buzz of activity, all day. Record number of visitors and the first time I had seen military vehicles so overtly enter the grounds. We had gotten word earlier that the contract was coming to an end and I was going to be reassigned somewhere in Philadelphia. Rumors about the police force was they were bringing us on for some extra muscle. The building had wound down at this point, with only a skeleton crew of five or six left inside, plus nine other security personnel. They had doubled us up over the last few days. It was about 10.30 at night. I only had another 90 minutes on shift. I was on the eastern edge of the grounds, doing a routine check of the fence line when my walkie blared out into the silence. All security was being called to the main entry room. The voice spoke frantically, and I couldn't make out who was speaking. I started trotting towards the front of the building when I heard an alarm start blaring inside. Sounded like a fire alarm. I double-timed it and could see another guard running from the west edge of the perimeter. Right before I reached the door, it flew open, and two women wearing lab coats burst through the entryway, running down the steps right past me. They didn't stop to talk. 
the other guard caught up to me, and together we moved into the building. Multiple alarms were going off all inside the building, and the overhead sprinkler system had been set off, water pouring down on the tops of our heads. We made our way to the entry point and linked up with five of our guys. Three were missing. None of us knew what was going on, and we were under strict orders not to cross past the entry point unless directed to do so by building personnel. Two gunshots from the hallway past the door were followed by a scream of pain, which was cut short abruptly. Order or not, this is what we were here for, and we moved into the hallway, leaving one man back to guard the door. The hallway was clean and sterile like you would see in an intensive care ward. We were unfamiliar with this part of the building, and when we came to a junction, we split into two groups. I took the north corridor with two other guards, and we made our way down the hallway meticulously checking each room. Most were empty, but a have had what looked like medical equipment stored neatly on shelves or covered by tarps. As we neared the end of the hallway and came upon a set of double doors that crashed open slamming into the walls beside, a body came soaring down the hallway, slamming into the guard next to me. I raised my AR to the doorway in response, but nothing trained me for what came barreling through. Calling them human would be a stretch, but three of them came crashing through the door after the body. Each was nine feet tall with gray-green skin. They were completely nude but bore no signs of gender. Their bodies were lean, and a maze of veins ran along each of their limbs. They had human faces but were devoid of any type of hair. One of the three had a tangle of tubes and wires trailing behind him, the other two riddled with scars and gaping holes on their torsos. As soon as they saw us, they rushed. I was able to get a single shot off and watched it soar through the chest of the first one. It didn't even break stride. The last thing I remember was my head slamming into the hallway wall. I woke up on a military base about 30 miles from where we had been. I immediately knew I was concussed and I couldn't stand. It was a long time before anyone came to see me, and when they did, it wasn't the least bit enlightening. There was no explanation as to what I saw or what those things were. Nobody would even formally acknowledge that I had been engaged in any type of combat at all. I received fair medical treatment, but that's it. Eventually, one of my superiors from the firm came to see me and let me know that I was being placed on temporary leave until I recovered and could return to duty. After I got home, I tried reaching out to a few of the other contractors I knew, but still haven't been able to get in touch with any of them. Once this story gets out, I'm sure they'll know who blew the whistle. I don't know what will happen to me, and at this point, it doesn't really matter. We need to tell people what I saw. We need to let them know that the government is performing some kind of experiment, creating some kind of weapon. This happened in 2018 when I was camping with my family near Superior National Forest in Minnesota. We had camped near Superior National Forest before, a few times in fact, the last time was maybe two years before. We were going to meet up with my aunt and uncle, and they were bringing my cousins as well. We ended up packing too much in the car. It wasn't so bad at first, but after a couple of hours, we were feeling like sardines in a can. I've never been so happy as to see a campground in my life. We checked in, and then drove to our site and started to set up our tents, unpack our gear, you know the drill. We were there an hour before my aunt and uncle found us. We grilled burgers that night, and I ate way too much. I decided I was going to go walk it off and found myself walking one of the many trails in the area. The brush was really green and slightly overgrown, apparently from a wildfire a few years before. Everything kind of grows crazy afterwards, according to the rangers. There wasn't too many other people walking the trail. I wasn't really paying attention, just enjoying the surroundings and the quiet of the woods. At one point, I thought I heard something in the breeze, like a really light whispering of words. I kept walking for about 20 minutes and heard something again. This time I stopped and stood still, trying to listen. 
I looked around, trying to see if there was someone else around on the trail, but it seemed like I was alone. I noticed that it was quiet, I didn't hear any birds, or see anything moving around, and then I heard it again. It sounded like light whispering around me. I looked around me again, there wasn't a soul around me. I heard the whispering get louder, but it was weird. It wasn't really words, but it sounded like sentences being formed. I looked around and that's when I first saw it, a pale light off in the distance. I began to walk down the trail slowly, getting closer to where it was. When I got to about 20 feet or so, it blinked out and I heard the whispering again. I didn't know what to think. I just stood there, looking around me. Another light in the shape of an orb then appeared about 30 feet from where I was standing. Then another, about 20 feet from me off to my left. I tried walking left, and the light blinked out. I turned to try and walk up to the second light, but it suddenly blinked out. Now I'm starting to sweat and get goosebumps. When I began to hear the whispering again, and it seemed to get louder and louder in my ear, that was it. I turned around and started walking the way I came. When another orb appeared to the right of me, I started to run, and I swear two or three more appeared in the corner of my eyes as I ran down the trail. I didn't get far. I was running maybe 10 or 15 minutes before I ran into a couple on the trail. I guess I looked kind of crazy, because the looks they gave me spoke volumes. I stopped and watched them walk off down the trail, and I just waited to see them running back towards me. They never did. I walked a bit down the trail, and I saw them, but I didn't see any lights or hear any of the whispering. I just kind of stood there dumbfounded, wondering what the hell just happened. I decided just to walk back to my campsite. I don't know what happened or what I experienced in those woods. I walked back to camp and sat down with my family and just acted like nothing happened. I brought them to the same trail the next day. We walked the whole thing and nothing happened. I ended up going back by myself after that, but nothing happened. No light orbs, no whispering, nothing. We haven't been back there since, but I always wonder about those woods and what I saw on that trail. This is a crazy story that was told to me by my friend Karen. Both her and I live about 45 minutes northwest of Atlanta, Georgia in Cartersville. The encounter occurred the night of Wednesday, May 15th, 2019, while she was on her way home from work from the job that she'd been working at for over 30 years. School secretary at the local high school. That day she had put in a long day and ended up staying a bit later than usual to catch up on some paperwork. She hadn't wanted to do it, but the administration was coming down hard on her, and so she just bit the bullet and stayed that day until it was finished. And now, she was very much looking forward to getting home to her husband and dog and putting her feet up, hoping to avoid the headache that she could feel was coming on. About 10 minutes into her drive home along Center Road, she was finally east of Route 75 and driving the final stretch to her house. She and her husband chose their house when they were first married because of its location, only a few miles to town but also a bit in nature, as evidenced by McCaskey Creek Campground being right down the road. However, at this point, she couldn't help but think about how this last bit of the drive always made her nervous. It was notorious with the neighbors for being a spot where animals roamed and wandered into the road. She had even hit a deer there herself a few years back, and she could name off at least six other people she knew who had also hit deer on that stretch of the road. Sure enough, as Karen drove down the road, she noticed an unusual movement out of the corner of her eye, back off the road a bit. She knew this road like the back of her hand and could easily notice anything out of the ordinary. Her reflexes had reacted to the sight of a large animal flying from up along the side of her car and landing directly in the middle of the road in front of her, directly in the line of her headlights. 
She immediately slammed on her brakes, but was so close to the thing at this point that she thought for sure that she was going to slam into it, and she braced for the impact. And then, like a movie in slow motion, she watched as her car came to a sliding stop, skidding sideways down the road and towards the creature, watching as it threw its arms up in the air and jumped backwards to avoid being hit. Within seconds, she came to a stop. And there she sat in her car that was now sitting sideways in the middle of the road. All she could do was grip the steering wheel and watch as this creature. It turned its head away from looking at her and walked on two legs, making its way back to the side of the road, back in the direction that it had come from. Her headlights had clearly illuminated its grotesque features. They were somewhere between that of a man and a wolf. She estimates that it was easily the size of a large bear, but that its head was disproportionately large in comparison to its body, and she described the snout as long and almost sharp-looking. The fur on its back was black except along its spine, where it was a bit of a lighter brown color, and the fur on its chest and belly was lighter still, and it had a tail that looked like it was covered in fur but Karen couldn't see very well once it left her headlights and then started to doubt that feature. But she said that the most startling thing about this creature was its eyes. They were bright, almost electric, and seemed to reflect her headlights in a way that looked like they glowed in the dark. Karen sat there staring at it as it made its way back into the darkness, and only when it completely disappeared did she finally release the breath she had been holding. The encounter lasted all of about 15 seconds, but it felt like an eternity to Karen. And then, in a move that she still doesn't understand, and second guesses to this day, she slowly drove her car off the road, off to the side and got out. She then walked over to the area where the creature disappeared and looked around for any clues as to what it could have been. In retrospect, she feels she needed some sort of closure to come to terms with what had just happened. But she says it was almost like an out-of-body experience in that her brain wasn't really controlling her actions. She felt like it was instinct or some other force pulling at her. But there was nothing there, nothing at all in the entire area that looked out of place except for the skid marks her car made back on the road. After a bit, she decided to give up on trying to figure out what it was and started walking back to her car. She turned her back to the trees and faced her car. And that's when she heard it, the sound of twigs snapping in the trees behind her. She spun around, her heart racing, saw nothing but knew she had to get out of there fast. She then tried to make a run for it back to her car, but before she could take more than two steps, there it was. The creature was standing right there in front of her again. This time, it didn't jump backward like before when her car came at it. It just stood there, looking at her with those unnerving eyes. And then, the thing happened that still haunts her to this day. She heard words in her head, as if it had spoken to her. She remembers hearing a voice telling her to leave and never come back. Karen was rooted in place, stuck to the ground with a combination of fear and confusion rushing through her head. She couldn't understand how the creature could get in her head like that. Its voice was so unexpected that it took her a minute to even realize that she should be afraid. Eventually, fear and adrenaline kicked in and she tried to run for her car again but found herself tripping over her own feet and landing hard on the grass before getting anywhere. The creature seemed to be drawn to her laying there, and it walked over to her. It was right next to her. She didn't dare look up at it. Instead, she kept her head down and her eyes looking at its feet. Feet that were rough and calloused in a way that only a wild animal would look. And then as she was processing all this, the creature leaned down so that its face was only inches away from her face. She could hear it breathing slowly and deeply and watched as the drool dripping from its mouth and landed on the ground next to its feet. And she could smell it too. The smell of death and rotting flesh. She closed her eyes and started to pray, but before she could utter a single word, she blacked out. 
To this day, Karen has never been able to recall how she got there or give a clear description of what happened after blacking out. She only remembers waking up in her car and finding herself sitting in the driver's seat. The first thing she did was check herself for injuries and thankfully, all she saw were the few cuts from tripping and falling. She looked in the mirror and her face was pale and her eyes were black from her mascara streaming down her face. But luckily, she hadn't been harmed at all and after looking at the clock, she determined that she had only been out of it for about 15 minutes. Her body and hands were still shaking uncontrollably, but she knew she needed to get out of there. When she was finally able to get her body under control, she started the car and pulled off onto the road and continued on her way home. While driving, she literally couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched, and it made her feel so uneasy that she had to pull over a few times just to calm down. She would sit and take at least a dozen deep breaths before pulling it together enough to continue. Although it was terrifying to stop the car, she had no choice because the alternative would have surely ended with her wrecking the car. By the time she made it home, she had convinced herself that the entire thing was just a dream and that she had hallucinated the creature. There is just no way this had happened, she thought. The truth just didn't make any sense. She didn't even want to tell her husband for fear that he wouldn't believe her, and she would look like even more of a lunatic. But in the end, she really had no choice. Because as soon as he saw her walk through the door, he jumped up and rushed over to see what had happened. It was beyond obvious that something was up. Karen knew right then that she needed to tell him the entire truth and get his opinion on what she should do. When Karen finally summoned the courage to talk about what happened, he looked at her with a seriousness that made her regret ever telling him in the first place. She was sure he was now concerned about her mental health, but instead he said that he did believe her and that he had an idea of what it maybe could be. He told her about a creature that he had heard of as a boy that was known as a Mothman. He told her that it was a creature that was seen throughout the Appalachian Mountains and that it was known to be very aggressive. It usually preyed on small animals, but there have been cases where it has attacked people as well. Well, that was a creature that Karen had never heard of before, but after hearing about it, she figured that it was possible that that is what she saw. Together, they chose not to tell anyone else about the incident for fear of being ridiculed and laughed at. They didn't even call the police. They both did some research online, and other possible creatures popped up on various websites. But her memory of it all was becoming more and more unsteady, almost like the memories of scary stories you heard as a kid. Or the memories of scary experiences. They're there, but you wonder if your brain embellished parts and made them worse than they really were. One thing that has definitely changed, though, is that after decades of driving that road to work, she now takes a different route altogether. She can't even get near the area without starting to violently shake. The story I'm sharing with you here took place in North Carolina in 2021. However, I am currently living in West Virginia. The weekend in question, or rather, the weekend this happened, I had headed south to an area in the vicinity of the Great Smoky Mountains for a solo camping trip. Stuff was happening for me personally at this time in my life, and I needed to be alone to get away from some things and clear my head. Also, I seriously needed the fresh air after being basically cooped up the last two years or so. So, I drove down Friday night and had an uneventful first evening setting up camp and then headed to bed early. I got up early the next morning and didn't waste any time heading out since I wanted to beat most of the midday heat of summer. All was good for a while until I was hiking up a steep trail and huffing and puffing. When I stopped to catch my breath, I saw an off-leash dog way off in the distance. At first, it didn't even really register with me, but it was coming my way, and as it got closer, I became aware of how much larger it was than dogs usually are, and how it was moving along using only its back legs. It had reddish-brown fur and was massive, easily the size of a bear, but by the way it was standing, 
I was totally confused. I looked around to see if anyone else was on the trail, but I was the only one. It was just me and this creature, standing on this mountain trail in the middle of nature. Nobody, no help anywhere in sight. The fear started to set in as I began to fully understand the seriousness that this could be a dangerous situation. I didn't know what this creature was, and I had no idea if it would attack me. Thoughts started creeping into my mind of all the things that might possibly happen, but I stood my ground, and I didn't flinch, hoping that if I didn't make any movement it would just go away. Now, don't think I was being brave by doing this. I actually couldn't have moved at all even if I had wanted to, and soon it was right next to me. I remember thinking that this must be it. I was going to die. That it was going to kill me. But then it stopped just a few feet away and it simply looked at me. Well, stared at me is more like it. I was looking into its piercing eyes and I swear it was talking to me with them. In that moment I knew it could think, just like us. I just knew it. I could sense it. And also, now it didn't seem mad, just curious. Like the way a dog would come running up to you frantically and then just stop and look at you. I was out for my morning walk on a crisp April morning when I saw something strange in the distance. I instantly knew something wasn't right because I walked this path almost every day and knew it intimately. I squinted to bring it into better focus, but that didn't make sense. I wasn't sure what it was, but I also didn't want to get closer to find out, so I hid behind a tree and just watched it. The creature was definitely big and definitely hairy. It was also insane looking. I would say it almost had a mean look on its face, but it didn't seem to be doing anything harmful. It just stood there, looking around. I remember thinking that it was acting curious even though its face was horrid and that I wasn't sure how to read into anything from its looks. And then, the creature started sniffing around like it was trying to catch the scent of something and after a few quick minutes, it turned its head in my direction and looked directly towards me. I pulled myself in tight and stood as straight as I could behind the tree hoping to throw it off, hoping it wouldn't see me. But I next had footsteps on the ground basically, twigs breaking and leaves moving about. I could also feel the heaviness of the creature as its legs hit the ground with each step. It was walking over to me. I was terrified. But then I heard it make a noise that sounded like a cross between a grunt and a moan. The noise wasn't exactly scary, but it was so confusing that the hair stood on my arms. Even still, I didn't want to lean outside of the protection of the tree to look and see. I just remained there staying still and upright as much as possible. Next, I could feel the air turn warmer, and I heard the sounds of slow, heavy breathing, raspy breathing. I could tell that the creature was very close to me now, and now I couldn't stop myself, and I needed to see what I was up against. I slowly leaned sideways to try and look around the tree without exposing my body, and there only 10 feet on the other side of the tree was this thing, animal-like, but manlike, and we looked at each other for what felt like forever. Its face is still seared in my memory, and I'll never forget looking into its eyes. And then it blinked, shook its head, turned around and walked away. I watched it go until it completely disappeared into the woods. I was dumbfounded. Maybe it was just curious and didn't find me to be anything to worry about. I stood there pondering that thought when I heard another noise. This time it was a weird, guttural noise, different than the grunting and moaning I had just heard earlier. This noise sent an extra shiver down my spine. And just as I was thinking about it, I saw the same animal thing heading back towards me, lumbering directly towards where I was still standing. The creature slowly approached me and now I was terrified because it was coming back. Did it change its mind about me? Was it now thinking I was a threat? but I didn't want to run away and spark it to chase me. I didn't know what to do. As the creature got closer, I could see its eyes again, the eyes that seemed to reflect a brain that could think and communicate, 
and it still looked curious, not angry or mad. So I stood there and waited to see what it would do. It came close, like within a few feet, and sniffed around at me with its big snout. Then it made the same weird noise again, and I almost wondered if it was trying to speak to me. After a few minutes of listening to it make these noises, but not reacting in any way, the creature seemed to get tired of me. It turned its head away as if looking off into the distance for something, and then it turned around and walked in the direction it was looking. This time it was gone for good. I never saw it again. But I will never forget those strange noise it made, and even more so, I'll never stop thinking about what it might have been trying to say to me. I am convinced that it came back to communicate, but I wasn't able to understand. Either way, it's all something that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And now, every time I hear a strange noise in the woods, I always wonder if it's the creature coming back and wanting to try to communicate again. To be honest, I really wish I had been able to understand it. I even have dreams where we were able to understand each other and all it wanted to do was to learn why we're so scared of it. I'm a game warden in Northern California. As an outdoorsman, it's a dream job. But that's not to say it's without its drawbacks. For example, whether we're having summer heat or freezing winter temperatures, I'm expected to head into the woods to protect our land's natural resources. And of course, dealing with armed and sometimes drunk hunters is a risk. Despite all this, I love it and couldn't see myself ever doing anything else. That is, until a few months ago, Deer season in all its various forms runs a few months out of the year, generally October through January, and up to April in some cases, with the busiest season being in November. But around here, some folks forget about deer season altogether and strike out into the woods during the summer. That's where I come in. It was this past August, and we had already sighted dozens of poachers in the county. Fortunately, none turned violent or had gotten out of hand. I was on good terms with a lot of the people who lived out in hunting territory. Most of them had big properties with some type of water feature which drew the deer in. It was late afternoon when I got a call from one such person who told me he had seen a group of three men with rifles cutting across the back of his property line. I called it in and headed over to the property. If it was the group I thought it was, they wouldn't give me too much trouble and so I knew I would be fine to approach them on my own. That was a mistake. After a brief conversation with the property owner, I left my vehicle parked in his driveway and headed out into the wood behind his home. On the way, I saw plenty of deer droppings and the trees were marked up from shedding bucks. I'd have to remember this spot for myself. I walked in following a game trail for about 30 minutes but found no sign of the illicit hunters. This was odd. There really wasn't any reason for them to have gone any deeper than this. What's odder is that besides the signs, I hadn't seen a single deer. Right when I had decided to turn around and search in another direction, I came across the carcass of a dead buck. Its neck was broken, pale eyes stared at a 180 degree angle from its chest. Its body was crushed into the ground, running my hand along its rib cage. I could feel that they were shattered into pieces. Its hindquarters had been torn off and lay ten yards away, bloody entrails strewn across the ground like tree roots. I'm not prone to panic, but this was bizarre. The poacher certainly hadn't done this, and I knew of no animal that could or would enact such violence. I snapped a couple of quick pictures with my phone and started moving quickly back down the trail. That's when I felt it. The ground began to tremble slightly, and I heard a series of heavy impacts behind me. Despite being stricken with fear, I turned to see what it was. From the forest came a massive creature, at least ten feet high and half that across. Vines, leaves, branches, and twigs were wrapped around the creature in its entirety, like it was a walking piece of the forest floor. It walked on a pair of thick tree stump-like legs, and its arms ended in a pair of dense foliage roughly the size of a human head. I couldn't see anything that resembled a face. I stood frozen. The creature was taking slow, ponderous steps, not going in any specific direction. 
Hoping to get away quietly, I started backing slowly away, eyes locked on to the creature. Bad idea. I pulled a stupid move and accidentally stepped onto a dead branch. The noise snapped out like a gunshot. The lumbering beast snapped in my direction and after a brief pause began storming towards me. I ran. I ran as hard as I ever had. In spite of its size, I could hear the creature keeping pace with me, crashing through the brush like a tank. I finally got a lead when the trail narrowed, the creature being so massive that it needed to force its way through. I cut around a curve in the trail and it was momentarily out of sight. I heard a thunderous crack, and looking behind me and up, I saw a tree falling into the forest. Then I felt something grab me. A man with a rifle slung over his shoulder pulled on my arm and told me to follow him. I could hear the creature back out on the trail once again crashing through the forest. I followed the man for a minute until he led me to an overturned tree that had created a deep depression in the ground. Two other men were already tucked in underneath. My savior and I joined them. The four of us packed tightly together. We sat for an hour, none of us saying a single word. We could hear the monster stomping through the forest, searching. Once it came close enough that we could see it, two of the men readied their rifles for a last stand, but it ambled away without incident. When at last it grew quiet, the four of us left the safety of the tree and ran. We ran all the way to the tree line without seeing the creature, and there we stopped to catch our breaths. It was obvious that these were the poachers I was with, but they had literally saved my life. As a group, we agreed to never speak of this incident for fear of ridicule. Wild allegations like this could cost me my job. And with that, the three of them headed off towards their truck, which they said was close by. I returned to the driveway, and fortunately, the owner wasn't home. I was too shaken up to have a normal conversation anyway. I called in and said I didn't find the poachers and that I would be cutting my shift a few hours early. I'm still a warden, and I still go into the forest every day, but it's not the same. I don't feel a sense of calm or peace anymore. I'm constantly on edge, dreading that I will encounter this thing again. If you have any suggestions for how I can move on, please let me know. I'm a park ranger stationed in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. I became a ranger five years ago to live out my dream of spending my days in the rugged beauty of the mountains. However, I recently requested to be placed on strict desk duty. The thought of going back out there, well, I'll probably never go out again. Let me explain. The Green Mountains aren't exactly a tourist hotspot. Most vacationers tend to drive through on their way to Lake Champlain, and that was just fine with me. I felt a sense of kinship with the folks who did visit and always enjoyed my time speaking with them on the trail. And that's why, even as I finished a shift one late afternoon and a call went out for a missing hiker, I turned right around and headed back into the mountains to find the lost man. He was in his late forties and had become separated from his two teenage sons along one of the more demanding trails. He had hung back to rest while they went ahead to explore, and when they returned, he had just vanished without a trace. Night was falling and a rescue copter wouldn't make it out until the morning. Unless he was seriously hurt, he would probably be just fine. But I saw an opportunity to help, so I took it. God knows that I wished I hadn't. I kept a full pack in my truck, and after confirming the search grid, I headed off on my own. Since I was technically off-duty, I wasn't a part of the official roster, so I volunteered to check out a few locations where I thought he would most likely be. And about two hours later, night had completely fallen, and I had had no luck. I figured I would start making my way back to the service station and call it a night. But on the way back, I thought I heard someone calling out from deep in the forest. I headed in the direction of the voice, but as I approached it, it abruptly cut off. I was puzzled and a little worried that something had happened, but the voice cried out again hundreds of yards away, now from the completely opposite direction. I once again trekked towards the voice with the same conclusion, but the voice cut off again. This was very disturbing. 
There was no way someone would have been able to change positions that quickly, especially in the dark. I called out several times but received no response. I decided to keep moving and continued down the trail, but just a few minutes later, I heard the same calling sounds. I decided to keep still this time and see what happened. The voice cried out several times, but I remained stationary and silent. Several seconds lapsed and the cry came again, this time closer, and now with a more desperate edge to it. Something felt wrong. I don't know what, but some gut instinct told me to continue going down the trail, so I did. The voice didn't like this. I had gone maybe 30 yards down the trail when the cry came again, this time coming from the place I had been a few moments before. But this time, the voice was angry. Not shouting for help, but rather demanding I stop. I didn't, and instead I began running. A shriek of rage pierced the night air, and I felt a violent tremor rip throughout the forest floor. I was sprinting down the trail, and the voice continued its constant shrill wail. Then another one came from my right, followed by a third from my left. All throughout the forest, a chorus of voices screamed in that same wrathful tone, screaming for me to stop me, then to come back. At this point, I had no idea where I was, and each direction I headed seemed wrong. In this moment, I felt a fear like none I ever had before. And now the screams were losing their humanity, transforming into something sinister, like a manifestation of hate and fury. Then another scream from just ahead on the trail. I skidded to a halt and snapped my flashlight forward. There stood an immense black form, roughly the shape of a man but ten feet tall. It was shimmering like it was fighting to be both there and not there at the same time. I stood still for a moment and then the thing started racing towards me. I cut from the trail into the forest, running like I was in a sprint. Low branches whipped at my face and within minutes I felt the sting from half a dozen small cuts and scrapes. Even here off the trail the screams continued, they even increased. Every few minutes I saw another shadow out of the corner of my eye or caught one in the haze of my flashlight beam. I zigzagged through the forest. Twice I felt the presence of a creature as I rushed past. I could feel a grasping hand fall just short of grasping my arm or leg, and then the trees would erupt with another screech of fury. And so went the entirety of a long night filled with unspeakable horrors. For hours I ran through the woods. The screams filled the forest throughout the long night. A moment didn't pass without hearing it. Other things happened, and I can't bring myself to put them on paper. Not yet. I made it out. Somehow I made it. I wouldn't be writing this if I didn't. As the light grew slowly in the sky, the screams faded, the swiping of clawed fists disappeared, and the shadows diminished in size until it all finally ceased. By a miracle, I had ended up in a location familiar to me, and it was only a two-hour walk to find help. When I eventually made it out of the forest and found aid, I was taken to a hospital in Burlington and treated for numerous minor injuries. I even received several visits from my superior. When questioned, I simply told him I had gotten lost in the forest and had panicked. I'm a seasoned outdoorsman and my story received disbelieving looks and some questioning, but in the end it was dropped and I was left to recover in peace. If I told the truth, I would probably be placed on leave, which, as I think of it, might not be a bad thing. It's been two weeks now, and the missing hiker is still nowhere to be found. I hope he is still alive, but deep down I know, I know that whatever is out there found him. As for me, I'm still here just shuffling papers across my desk with no plans at all to head back out there. I had planned to spend a week camping and exploring Voyageurs National Park in northern Minnesota in the summer of 2015. Voyageurs is pretty remote, and to be honest, I was a little nervous traveling solo up there. There are only two campsites in the entire park that don't require a boat to access. I had done quite a bit of solo travel in the past and told myself that everything would be alright. I had just seen the movie Backcountry which was a gruesome film about a predatory black bear that attacked two campers in Canada. I blamed that for my uneasiness and brought two extra cans of bear spray. 
It was a five-hour drive to the park, and my fears seemed to settle by the time I reached the park in the early afternoon. I had reservations for two campsites during my trip. The first was only a 20-minute paddle from the lot where I had parked my truck. The second campsite, which I had planned to reach on Thursday, was a great deal more remote. As soon as I reached the forest on the other side of the river, my fears returned. It was the silence. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's what it was. And it wasn't just the kind of silence you get when the animals see a human in the forest. It was like the whole landscape was frozen. Nothing moved at all. Not the wind, not the leaves on the trees, nor the clouds in the sky. There were no birds, no squirrels, no bugs, nothing. Like I said, I didn't realize what it was at the time. I just knew something was very, very wrong. I kept my bear spray close as I set up camp. The strange silence would come and go throughout the evening, and I did my best to ignore it. But what came later I could not ignore. It was a stench. An ungodly rotten stench. I was putting out my fire for the night and suddenly it smelled like the whole forest had died. The smell was everywhere. I looked around for the source, but I couldn't pinpoint it. I circled around the campsite and the smell was just as strong on one side as it was on the other. I didn't know what it was. The only thing I knew is that I did not want to be in the woods that night. But then the smell disappeared after maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And I mean completely disappeared, like nothing had happened at all. I went to bed about an hour later and I didn't think about the strange smell anymore that night. Over the next few days, I would encounter the strange smell on and off. It wouldn't last longer than 30 minutes, but it was all-encompassing when it happened. It was so bad, I could barely breathe without gagging. After the third time it happened, I realized that it was preceded by that strange, unnatural silence. The forest would get quiet, like it was frozen, and then the smell would arrive. And when the smell disappeared, the forest would come alive again. I was averaging about 15 miles a day on foot and more than that if I traveled the waterways in the pack raft. And somehow, the smell would follow me wherever I went. I thought there must be something medically wrong with me. The forest would go silent, and it felt like I had suddenly lost my hearing, and then this stench would fill the air with no source. It had to be me. I must be having some sort of hallucinations. At least, that's what I thought at the time. I realized later that I was being followed. I stuck with my plan of reaching the remote backcountry campsite by Thursday afternoon. The trek to get there was mostly by water, and it was in the water when I finally saw what had been following me and causing that horrible smell. I was in my pack raft when I saw a pack of wolves swimming across the river. It was a rare sight even in northern Minnesota. There are definitely wolves in the backcountry, but they are rarely seen. There were four wolves, and they were swimming with determination. What I didn't notice at first was the elk swimming behind them. I couldn't see its face while it was in the water, just the antlers. At first glance, I thought it was just a pair of antlers or a skull floating in the water, since elk shouldn't even have a full set of antlers this time of year. But as I watched it closer, it was definitely swimming, and it looked like it was chasing the wolf pack. The elk's whole head was submerged underwater. I had no idea how it could hold its breath that long. As I continued to watch the scene unfold, that strange silence fell upon the water. I didn't need to wait for the stench to arrive before I knew that whatever was below those antlers was the thing that was following me in the forest. The wolves reached the shore and bolted into the woods beyond it. The creature was still swimming. I started paddling upriver from the direction I came. I knew what was going to come out of that water was some sort of monster and I wasn't about to spend another night out here with it. I had created some distance between the creature and myself, but not enough to feel remotely safe. The creature emerged from the water and the stench hit me despite being at least 50 yards away. It was a revolting sight. It had the body of an elk, but it was basically a walking skeleton. Its fur was white and nearly transparent, as was its skin. In some places I could see the pink of its organs through its skin, but that wasn't even the worst part. It had no hair on its face. I don't even think it had skin. 
It looked like just a skull with two dark sockets where its eyes should have been, and a gaping hole for a nose. It turned to look at me as if it was deciding if it should pursue the wolves, or me. I had my bear spray, but I had doubts it would work on that thing. It watched me for a moment as I very slowly paddled backwards before taking off down the path behind the wolves. I can't tell you how fast I paddled out of there. I haven't been camping alone since, nor have I ever smelled anything like that ever again, but I know that if I do, I'm getting the heck out of the woods before I meet anything like that again. Seeing it once was more than enough for me. This incident happened nearly five years ago, but it still shakes me to my core. My family and I frequented a lake house that we owned a few towns away. We planned our stay hoping it'd be a sunny weekend, but it ended up that a storm rolled in on the day this happened. I left for the lake house first, figuring I'd set up ahead of everyone. Plus, I wanted dibs on the back bedroom. It had beautiful dark cherry wood French doors that opened up onto the back patio. I cleaned up and settled in, and by this time, late afternoon was fast approaching. The dark clouds were starting to roll in, and along with it, a cool breeze. With no hesitation, I went out to the back storage house to grab some fresh-cut wood we had stored out there. I flipped on the light switch and proceeded to grab a few logs to put in the wheelbarrow. Just before I set the pieces of wood in, the light bulb started swaying with the wind and flashed over the bottom of the wheelbarrow. Upon further examination, it looked like a dark, reddish-black gunk. I didn't give it much thought at that point and continued loading wood on. As I rolled the barrel over to the front door, I made it just in time as rain began to pour. Once I had the fireplace going, I didn't mind. The taps of rain on the window and warmth crackling from the fire nearly put me to sleep. I would have fallen asleep too if my phone hadn't rung. It was the rest of my family calling to tell me that they were stuck behind a tree that had fallen during the storm. I didn't mind being alone, actually. I enjoyed my own company. With the storm, the trees and branches swaying outside started to sound more and more extreme. I could hear branches tapping against the window, but still I was unbothered and thought of it as soothing chaos. In an attempt to occupy my time, I flipped the television on and turned to the news channel. I could see the county was already being plagued by rolling blackouts and figured our area might be next. Wanting to be prepared, I searched around each room for spare candles. Not after long, I had a little collection of candles ready, just in case. Then a light bulb went off in my head, and I remembered that the portable backup generator we had was in my room. I made my way down the hall and felt a strong wind coming and could see movement from the light coming out from under the door. I busted into the room and saw the French doors wide open. I rushed over and closed them and locked them, thinking the strong wind must have opened them. As soon as I closed those doors, I heard a knock at the front door. It couldn't be my family, I thought. They were still stuck in traffic. And no one ever comes out here other than us. I reached for a baseball bat in the closet before slowly making my way towards the door. I stepped up to the door and glanced through the peephole and saw an officer. Well, this was better than what I was thinking, and so set the bat down and opened the door. Hello, ma'am. I was passing through and wanted to warn you that the roads leading into town are closed, he said. I told him I was aware of the situation and was perfectly fine. He nodded and looked past me like he was looking to see if anyone else was inside. I felt bad and reluctantly asked if he'd like to step inside. After all, he was drenched from the rain and seemed out of breath. He came in and removed his hat and set it in the kitchen. I noticed he had a standard police hat, but the rest of his outfit seemed like a casual outfit. I wasn't a fool and wanted to be safe, so I asked to see his badge. He let out a chuckle and said, Well, of course you can't be too careful. He reached into his back pocket and flashed his badge. I could tell he felt the need to explain further and went on to tell me it was his day off, but given the situation was called in. My mind was more at ease and I offered him some coffee. I told him he could warm up by the fire if he'd like, but oddly enough, he sat a safe distance from it and claimed he was warm enough in the house. 
We talked for around an hour, and I made my way to the kitchen to put our mugs in the sink. The window in front of the sink overlooked the road, and I didn't see a cop car in sight. Things started to go off in my mind, but maybe I was overthinking it. When I returned to the living area where I left him, he was gone. I cautiously walked around calling out for him. He wasn't in the bathroom, so this is when I started to worry. As I made my way around, I heard commotion coming from the back storage house. I peeked through a window and saw the door to it was wide open. Immediately I grabbed my bat again. I don't know what came over me, but I had zero fear as I rushed out to the back storage house. Rain was pouring down and trees were swaying. Still, I trucked myself out there. The closer I got to the back storage house, a foul smell plagued the air. Just as I was about to step inside, I went to scream, but no sound came out of my mouth. I was frozen from what my eyes were witnessing. There he was, with his back towards me hunched over, squelching and chewing. Red liquid dripped to his feet. I backed up against the side of the door and he paused and slowly turned. His mouth was covered in blood and a grimace of a smile took over his face. I remembered his teeth, sharp and long. I was hungry and you were good company, he said. My eyes pulled away from his mouth for a second, and that's when I noticed the lifeless rabbit in his grasp. All I could do was fall against the door. That's the last thing I remembered. The next thing I knew, I awoke abruptly to find myself on the floor of the back storage house. I shot up and there next to me lay the remains of the rabbit. Next, I noticed that a blanket had been laid over me, could it be that I was just spared by a vampire? And was it because I was good company? People already think I'm a bit of an odd duck. But seriously, I think it's because I have an open mind. And it freaks them out to realize not everything is within their control. Being unconventional is really what led me to this encounter in the first place. Because normal folks aren't out roaming neighborhoods at four in the morning. I just wanted to earn some extra money to send my kids to a good school and move out of my mother-in-law's house. I tried the usual job boards and help wanted sections to find something part-time. But everything was going to interfere with my kids' schedules. So I finally paid attention to this flyer that kept showing up in our mail for newspaper deliverers. This was back in the day when that was a thing. The problem was, I had to wake up at 3 in the morning, and I am not an early riser by nature. I had to get down to the distribution center to roll up the papers and stuff them into bags. What a waste of plastic, really. But living in West Virginia, the weather is unpredictable, and you can't imagine how angry people get over a damp newspaper. I had close to 300 papers to deliver. I'd pile them in the back seat of my car and get out to my route around 4 in the morning. It was mostly peaceful, really. Everyone was asleep except me. I'd look at the dark windows and wonder about all the people who lived there. There were a lot of cottontail bunnies out, though. That's when I became super aware of nocturnal creatures. Those bunnies were taking care of their business like it was the middle of the day. And the foxes. And the raccoons. All the people sleeping and oblivious to the worlds that opened up in the dark. And at this particular time of year, moths. It was May, and I don't know if you're aware, but there are close to 2,000 species of moths in West Virginia. Moth eggs hatch between April and May, and I mean some years they come out in swarming hordes. That year was especially bad. They were everywhere. Parts of my route were easy. The residential neighborhoods with the houses in a row most of those people were fine with me just tossing their paper as close to the porch as I could get it. But there were always the ones, you know? They wanted their paper tucked in a specific slot beside a specific bush under a particular beam of wood. Oh my gosh, I don't know how they live. For those, I had to get out of my car and tuck the precious newspaper in its exact spot. Everybody had their porch lights on. Guess what moths are attracted to? So whenever I had to approach a porch, those buggers would swarm me. You can't imagine how they would flap and flutter all around me and get caught in my clothes. I had really long hair then, and they would swarm into my hair like they were going to build a cocoon in there. 
They really eked me out. My goal was always to get back in the car without bringing a bunch of them with me. It was impossible. That was bad enough, but then you should have seen the apartment buildings I had to do. I had to go down this stairwell toward the incredibly bright lights they had lighting the entrance. There were hundreds of moths trapped in the stairwell. They'd get down there and be unable to figure out how to get out. Picture me holding a huge bag of newspapers, fumbling with my master key to get in, and being pummeled by hundreds of moths swirling all around me. It truly looked like I was starring in a horror movie. I'll tell you, my paycheck did not reflect that. So I'd get in there and try to slam the door behind me, but inevitably dozens of moths would follow me in. It was endless. Like I said, that was an especially bad year for them. Anyway, that was all well and good. I'd get in there and leave the papers and get out as fast as I could. But this night, I came up the stairwell and laying there was a mangled raccoon. It looked mangled, but flattened, and like it had somehow been sucked dry. I screamed so loud. But then I'm running toward my car and I kid you not something is crouching on the roof. I had parked in a dark spot to avoid the moths, you know, so it was hard to see. But this thing was crouched and looked like it had huge black folded up wings and it was scratching at the roof of my car. It looked toward me and its eyes were gleaming red. If you thought I screamed before, you should have heard me scream then. It was an ungodly scream and I took off back to the apartment building. I was shaking like a leaf, but I managed to unlock the door and get back in there. I ran up the stairs to a landing and looked out the window where I could see my car. It was still there, scratching and scratching. But then this thing stood up on my car. It was like the size of a man. And then it leapt into the air and just swooped away. I couldn't even move. It was petrifying. We didn't even have cell phones in those days. I waited there until sunrise. And then when someone came out of their apartment to get their paper, I told them I was the delivery person and asked to use their phone. I said I had car trouble, which wasn't exactly a lie. I went outside and all the moths in the stairwell were gone. There was no evidence of moths anywhere, but the roof of my car was a maze of scratches. The Pacific Northwest can be merciless, especially during fire season. Climate change has only made matters worse. More fires, more risks. Those are risks we all accepted, though. We all knew what we were getting into when we began our training to become wildland firefighters. Still, there are some things out here that none of us are prepared for. We ran into one of those things last summer. A wildfire had been spreading for a few days. We were working tirelessly, establishing fire lines and setting backfires in order to limit the spread. Things were turning in our favor. The perpetual glow of the fire in the distance made lighting our campsite irrelevant. We could light and extinguish as many tiny fires as we pleased, and it wouldn't help or hurt our visibility. What we did need, however, was a consistent source of fresh water. We were supplementing our supply with water from a nearby stream, which we purified each night for planned consumption the following day. Occasionally, that meant one of us would trek alone to the stream and refill a few of our containers. It was my turn at the stream, and that was when the creature came for me. My eyes were on the water when a growl came from the opposite side of the bank. It was faint at first, so low that I mistook it as the ambient sounds of the unsatisfied fire in the distance. Then it got louder. When it heightened to its greatest pitch, when it sounded most like a scream, it stopped suddenly. By then my gaze had snapped upwards. I was scanning the spaces between the trees, looking for a bear or a cougar. The few heartbeats that passed felt like a millennium. I saw nothing. I heard nothing, but then the beast wanted to be seen. I watched a great hulking mass step out from the shadows. The red glow of the fires painted its shaggy fur an unforgettable shade of orange and red. It must have been approaching eight feet tall. I'd never felt so small. 
I'd seen every part of a forest fire before. I'd seen the way it changed and scared the animals that lived there. I always felt like I was fulfilling a purpose at that moment. Looking at this animal, though, I felt nothing. Its eyes caught the light and reflected it right back at me. It wanted me to see those eyes. It wanted me to stare into them. Otherwise, why would it have stayed? It lingered there. Was it judging me? Was it appraising me for my work in trying to stop the fire that was burning through its home? If that was the case, it found me unworthy. Maybe it didn't understand what we were doing there. Maybe it just didn't like the way the smoke had clung to my skin. I smelled like the very thing that was destroying the forest. Why would this creature trust me? Suddenly it snapped a branch off of the nearest tree and hurled it in my direction. I'm lucky that the beast's aim was slightly off. The branch plunged into the earth beside me and sunk deep into the mud. It could have been my body, it was piercing. I didn't stick around to give the creature another chance. As I saw it step toward me with a large five-toed foot, I turned to flee. I dropped the water. The men were going to hate me for that, but my life was on the line. They'd have to understand. I yelled with every lunge, every desperate duck beneath the foliage, and prayed that I'd make it back to my group before the giant creature caught up with me. Maybe with enough of us together, the thing would back off. Another branch smashed against the tree trunk to my left. I felt pieces of wood scrape my face as the limb exploded on impact. I couldn't believe how powerful the thing behind me truly was. Then I did it. I broke through the wall of undergrowth and into the clearing where we had forged my campsite. The other members of my crew didn't hesitate to help me. They stood together and prepared to defend one another from whatever monster was chasing me in the woods. I know they were expecting the same as me. Either a bear or a wildcat. When nothing appeared, the murmurs began. They accused me of playing a prank. They predictably scolded me for leaving the water behind and untended. The color draining from my face and the shivers that refused to pass only convinced a few of them that I was telling the truth. I didn't sleep for the rest of our time out there. I found myself constantly drifting back to the trees, waiting for the next moment that the creature wanted to reveal itself to me. That moment never came. As fire season approaches again, I find myself wondering if I'm on borrowed time. How long before the monster in the woods reappears? How many more times could I have dodged the things it was throwing at me? Maybe if I'm lucky, the fires won't bring me back to that area. I don't know how I'll focus if I'm out there again. I know it's lurking, stealthy and quiet despite its size. I do know that if it does appear, I'll make sure that someone else sees it. I'm tired of no one believing me. I haven't given up on telling this story, but the face of rejection and disbelief does get tiring. Do you believe me? Have you ever seen anything like the animal I saw last summer? I need to convince as many people as possible. I want to know what it is. I want to know why it attacked. My family and I were driving from Michigan to Arizona to visit my sister who had just moved there. It was a long trip, nearly 2,000 miles, but we were excited to see her and explore the area near her place. We had been on the road for a few days and were somewhere in the middle of Colorado when the incident occurred. I'm a school teacher and my wife works in IT. We have two children, a 10-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. We planned the road trip to coincide with our summer break so we could spend quality time as a family. It was late at night and we were driving through a rural area with no cell phone service. We were listening to music and the kids were sleeping in the back seat. My wife and I were chatting when we simultaneously saw something on the side of the road. At first we thought it was a hitchhiker, but as we got closer, we realized it was something else entirely. It was a humanoid figure, covered in fur and walking upright on its hind legs. It had piercing, glowing yellow eyes like none we'd ever seen before. The creature was about six feet tall and had long, sharp claws. It freaked us out and we both commented on it, asking out loud what it was. 
We stopped to get a better look at it, and the creature turned its head to look directly at us. It hunched its head down, and we knew immediately from the look on its face and its aggressive stance that it was not friendly. Out of nowhere, it lunged at our car, scratching the door with its claws. We were terrified. We tried to call for help on our cell phones, but there was no signal. We were completely alone in the middle of nowhere, with an insane creature coming at us. The creature continued to scratch at the doors and tried to break through. We knew that we were in danger. We tried to drive away, but it was too fast and kept up with us easily. We were panicking and worried about our children's safety. We didn't know how to protect them or escape from the creature. It was a nightmare. The creature then jumped on the hood of our car, and we could feel its weight pressing down on the metal. We were afraid that it would break through and attack us. My spouse swerved and was able to fling the creature off the car. We took off down the road with our kids losing it in the back seat. After driving for a while, we finally found a gas station with a working phone. We called the police and they came out to investigate. They didn't believe our story at first, but when they saw the scratches and damage to our car, it was obvious that something strange had happened. They ended up calling in a local Native American tribe who had extensive knowledge of the area and the local wildlife. They told us that we had encountered a skinwalker, a powerful and dangerous creature that could shapeshift into different forms. The tribe members explained that the skinwalker was a malevolent being that could transform into any animal or human form, and it was known to attack and harm humans. They told us that the skinwalker had been following us for some time, and we were lucky to have escaped with our lives. The tribe members shared that the skinwalker was a cursed individual who had gained supernatural powers through dark magic. They were once human but had made a deal with evil spirits to gain these powers, and in turn, they were cursed to spend their life as a skinwalker. The tribe members also revealed that skinwalkers were rare and only found in specific areas of the country, and their existence was not widely known or acknowledged. They warned us to keep our encounter a secret and not to share it with anyone else. After the tribe members performed a cleansing ritual on us and our car, they advised us to leave the area immediately and not to stop until we reached a safe location. We took their advice and drove to a nearby town where we spent the night in a hotel, grateful to be alive and safe. The encounter with the skinwalker left us all in shock. We couldn't believe that such creatures existed and how close we had come to serious harm. We were also grateful for the help we received from the police and Native American tribe. In the weeks that followed, we researched more about skinwalkers and Native American culture and folklore. We learned that they were not to be taken lightly, and that encountering one was a rare and terrifying experience, and most people who come in contact with one don't make it out alive. We also realized that the world was more mystical and strange than we ever knew. The encounter with the Skinwalker was a life-changing event for us. It taught us to be more aware of our surroundings and to respect the power of nature and the supernatural. We also realized that there was much more to the world than what we saw on the surface, and that we needed to keep an open mind to the possibilities of life in the universe. It also made us realize that some mysteries were never meant to be discovered. We learned to respect the boundaries of different cultures and traditions, and to be more mindful of the consequences of our actions. It was 1988, and there was a scary story going around at my college about a dark figure that had been spotted hanging out on the campus roofs and in the bell tower. Some versions of the tale said it was a demon. Others claimed it was the ghost of a student who died years ago on school grounds. No one really knew the origin, but the stories went back for years. The first ever record of it was from 1963 and that sighting even managed to make it into the local paper. There wasn't much of a story, though. The article just said there had been reports of a mysterious black figure hanging around rooftops at the school. The descriptions of the figure ranged from a translucent wraith-like ghost to an owl-man hybrid. But there wasn't much to go on. 
These days it was a running gag around campus. People would dress up as the rooftop ghost for Halloween, but nobody actually believed it was ever anything to worry about. I lived in a house with three other roommates that year. We were directly across the street from the campus library. One night I was walking home from work late, from my job at the gas station on the corner of Main Street. The walk back to my house was maybe five minutes and there were lampposts all along the way. I had walked home from there dozens of times after dark and never once felt unsafe. This time was different. I don't know exactly what it was, but I felt like someone was following me. You know that feeling you get at the bottom of your stomach when you know something bad is coming? That's what I felt. I couldn't explain it. The streetlights were all lit. I looked around for strange cars parked along the roadway, but I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, but I just couldn't shake that feeling that someone was watching me. I thought for sure I was about to get mugged, but right then something told me that I should look up. I don't know where the thought came from. Maybe it was somewhere deep in my brain that recognized I was in danger. I looked up, first at the lampposts above my head, but I didn't see anything there. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a red light shining from the library. I turned to face it and noticed that there wasn't one red light, but two. It took me a moment to realize that the two red lights were eyes. I could see the silhouette of the creature against the lights coming from the hall behind the library. The creature was standing on top of the roof, almost hunched over. It was definitely the shape of a human or something similar in form but its arms were big, black wings. Normally I would see something like that and assume it was a prank set up by some of the other students. It wouldn't be too hard to get a funny costume and crawl onto the roof, but I knew in the pit of my stomach that this was no prank. There was something very real staring at me from the roof of the library, and it felt evil. The creature was staring right at me. It had to be me. There wasn't anyone else out here. I took a quick look around me to see if I was, in fact, alone out here, and it looked like I was. But when I turned back to look at the creature, it was gone. I searched for the creature. I didn't like not knowing where it was. That was somehow worse than when it was fixated on me from across the street. If I could see it, I could hopefully avoid it. I was about 100 yards from my house. I started walking. It was the most terrifying walk of my life. I didn't want to run in fear of causing the creature to chase me. But then I got that feeling again. That feeling that I should look up. I scanned the area as I was walking, but I didn't see anything. Not at first. But I kept looking towards a cluster of trees. Still on the opposite side of the road, but much closer to me than the library. I knew it was in those trees. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there. I don't know if humans have some sixth sense that alerts them to danger, but I knew. I didn't take my eyes off the trees, and then I saw it. It opened its eyes, but I couldn't see the creature in the shadows of the trees, just its eyes. I was still about 50 yards away from my house, and I knew it could get to me before I got there if it wanted. I tried my best to seem as calm as possible and just kept walking. I thought I saw the creature moving in the trees, but I couldn't be sure. It would hide its eyes from me for a moment, and then they would suddenly reappear. Then, the front door of my house flew open. It was one of my roommates and they screamed at me to run. I was hesitant to take my eyes off the trees, but I made a break for it. I made it to the house and my roommate slammed the door behind me. My roommate had seen the creature too, so I knew I wasn't going crazy. But here's the really strange part, as if things hadn't been strange enough up until now. My roommate said he had just had this weird feeling to get up from the couch and look outside. And right when he did, he saw me walking down the sidewalk, and then he too had the urge to look up, and that's when he saw that creature watching me and knew he needed to get me inside. Thank goodness for our sixth sense, or whatever you want to call it. I just know that whatever sense it was, it saved my life that day. I became a zookeeper for a weird reason. 
When the unavoidable conversation comes up, I wish I could say that it was the first stop on my journey to becoming a veterinarian or conservationist. Instead, I say it's because of a dream I had. One night, when I was really young, I dreamt that a strange animal came and knocked on my window. It looked like a dog with the face of a man. I didn't recognize the creature. I never learned its name. But I did feel at that moment that I knew that creature. It felt like that animal, and I belonged together. Weird, right? Anyway, that's why I became a zookeeper. There's something that calls me to the side of animals and wildlife. I feel at home beside them. And working at the zoo was much cheaper than vet school. Usually, when I tell that story, whoever's listening asks me if I'm waiting for that weird animal to come back. The answer's no, of course. I know that it was a dream, but that doesn't mean I haven't seen strange things on the job. Work in the New Mexico Zoo is closed on federal holidays, but we're still there to tend to the animals, of course. On one such holiday, I was part of a small crew making sure the animals received all of the food, water, and medicine they needed. All was going well until the afternoon. It was still midday when I saw it, which makes it worse, don't you think? I got to see it in the light of day. With all of its unnatural details, there was a cry from the bird cages. It was a panic, an entire orchestra of frightened birds. I was the nearest to that part of the zoo, so naturally I arrived there first. I expected to see a fight breaking out within the exhibits. Instead, it was the thing that was outside the cages that had the birds all rattled. It was perched on all fours in the posture of a dog or a wolf. I thought for a second that one of our canines might have escaped their enclosure, but the bright light of the afternoon kept me from making that mistake. It was almost entirely hairless, except for wiry patches around its shoulders and hind legs. Instead of hair, a single row of pointed spines sprouted from its back. My footsteps drew its eyes from the birds to me. Its snout was long, still canine, but several of its teeth protruded from its lips. Its face seemed to be locked in a permanent snarl. It glared at me with eyes that shined red in the sun. I took a step back. What else could I do? I didn't feel friendship radiating from this creature. I didn't feel secure. What I felt was threatened. I found myself wishing that I was inside the bird enclosures. Maybe I'd be yelling and squawking like them, but at least there would be something between this creature and myself. The animal's long claws scraped the gravel path as it shifted its entire body toward me. The spines on its back seemed to shake, as if it was scanning the air in order to predict my next movement. It predicted right. When I ran, I heard it scurry on the sidewalk just behind me. I imagined those claws that were on the stone tearing through my skin instead of through the dirt. I imagined those teeth sinking through my clothes and becoming lodged in my body. I couldn't let that happen. I yelled for help, hoping that with a few more people on scene, the creature might turn and run. I was lucky that someone else was nearby. I ran into the arms of a fellow zookeeper, who immediately began asking what happened and what I was running from. I couldn't believe that they didn't see it. Sure enough, when I turned around, the beast was gone. We inspected around the birdcage, though, and did find evidence of the beast's presence. There were faint tracks on the path, small markings where the animal's claws had scratched the ground. They were easily dismissed, but I knew what they were. When we tried to report the incident, I was surprised that animal control didn't arrive at the zoo alone. They were accompanied by state police. Maybe the weird canine was a wanted felon, I don't know. I do know that their questions were strange and that none of them acted like they believed me. In fact, I was basically dismissed even before my story began. We understand you think you saw something. I gave a vivid description and showed them the marks on the ground, but it was all for nothing. It was like they'd come to the zoo just to inspire some sort of doubt in my head. They wanted me to think I dreamed it, even though I knew the difference, and it was irrefutable. I don't want to inspire any conspiracies here, but it didn't sound like this was their first rodeo. It seemed like they had been here before. 
When I tried to refute all the arrogance that they were throwing at me, they threatened to arrest me. They claimed I was disturbing the peace. I think they were just throwing their weight around. Eventually they left and the creature never returned. That's lucky for us, I guess. Lucky for me, especially, because I wouldn't want to quit my job. I love the animals. But the creatures that come knocking on my window in my dreams are now a lot more terrifying than they are friendly. As a skeptic, I've always been hesitant to believe in things like aliens and UFOs, but one experience I had on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia completely changed my perspective. It was then that I became a full-blown believer in extraterrestrial life. I was hiking through the Appalachian Trail in Virginia, enjoying the beautiful scenery and fresh air. It was a gorgeous day and I had been hiking for hours, just taking in the sights and sounds of the forest. I was alone and enjoying the solitude, but little did I know that I was about to have an encounter that would change my life forever. I'm an avid hiker, and I'd been planning this trip for months. I'd always been fascinated by the Appalachian Trail and wanted to experience it firsthand. I was physically fit and well prepared for the journey, but I had no idea what was in store for me. As I was walking, I felt a strange presence around me. It was as if something was watching me from the shadows. I tried to shake off the feeling and focus on the beautiful scenery around me, but the feeling persisted. Then I saw something strange in the sky. It was a bright light, moving quickly and erratically. At first I thought it was a plane or a helicopter, or even a drone which isn't even allowed, but as it got closer, I realized it was something else entirely. It was a disc-shaped object, hovering in the air, just a few feet above the trees. I was just staring at the object, trying to figure it out. It was so strange because it was completely silent, and there was no wind, but the trees and bushes around it were rustling, as if it was creating a vortex of air. Suddenly, a beam of light shot out from the craft and surrounded me. I felt as if my body was being lifted off the ground and pulled into the ship, I couldn't move or scream or anything. Inside the ship, I was surrounded by beings that I could only describe as aliens. They were tall and slender with large heads and big black eyes. They didn't speak, but I could feel their thoughts in my mind. They were studying me, brutally probing me, and I was terrified. As they continued their examination, I started to feel intense pain. It was like they were cutting into my skin and probing my organs. I tried to scream, but I couldn't even open my mouth. It's a memory and experience that I'll have to struggle with for the rest of my life. I was beyond scared and I just wanted it to stop. I didn't know how much more I could take and I was afraid that they, or the pain of it, would kill me. The aliens seemed to be taking samples of my flesh probably for my DNA, and they were using machines and tools that I couldn't even begin to understand. I didn't know how much longer I could take it. After what felt like hours, they released me, and I found myself back on the trail. I was disoriented and had no comprehension of what had just happened to me. I stumbled through the woods, trying to make sense of it all. When I finally made it back to civilization, I went to the local police station to report what had happened. They were skeptical, to say the least. They told me to get off the trail, go home and get some rest. I guess they assumed I was ill-prepared for the trail. I did some research and found out that other people had reported similar encounters with aliens. They described the same creatures that had abducted me, and many of their details matched mine. I can't tell you how relieved I was to realize that I wasn't alone and that there was something out there. I started to look deeper into the alien phenomenon and found out about a government agency that was investigating these sightings. They had been keeping tabs on aliens for years and had supposedly even contacted them. I couldn't believe it. I don't know what to do with this information. My belief is that we truly don't know what is out there. We are helpless against the real powers at play. It was a humbling and terrifying experience and I'll never be the same. In the weeks and months that followed, I continued to research alien phenomenon. I never had another encounter with them, 
but I always feel that they are out there, watching us and studying us. It is a strange and unsettling feeling, but it also fills me with a sense of wonder and awe. Looking back on the encounter, I realize how lucky I was to have survived. I had come face to face with something beyond our understanding, something that most people will never see in their entire lives. It was an experience that left me with more questions than answers. What else is out there? What else don't we know? 